I can't believe I won. And you still got people out there with double masks and face shields and shit. Look into it. You can tell it's real because it looks so fake. Welcome to another episode of Look Into It. Tonight, no no childhood stories from me, no kiss stories, no wasp, no Queensryche. We're going to get right back into conspiracy theories today, and we're going to go deep and dark. Uh, but like I've said before in previous episodes, Every episode is going to be different, man. We're going to have a football fucking episode. Eventually, we're going to be talking about the Cleveland Browns and all that shit. So I'm going to let you know right off right off the top. I'm going to let you know right off the top whether you should uh, just turn this motherfucker off and just you want conspiracy theories every episode. I get it. Tin I got all kind of fucking conspiracy theory episodes, every, conspiracy social club fucking uh, a union of the unwanted all that shit on rockfin you don't need me you don't need me sometimes i'm gonna tell some childhood stories some people like it some people don't but today you're in luck we're gonna get fucking deep uh my guest today is the author of uh holly uh esoteric hollywood books one and two the one the only jay dyer jay how you doing what's up dude it's uh I'm kind of it's kind of surreal, man. It's crazy to be on here. I've watched a lot of your podcasts, so I'm really happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, dude, thank you for doing it, man. And also joining us is uh, my brother from another mother. Uh, he, he he's he's the um, the reason I'm even doing stand up comedy right now. You know, I, I used to do stand up comedy before 10th Planet. I was working as a writer on the man show for comedy central fucking hated it couldn't wait to get the fuck out of hollywood i hated it first day on the job i'm like what the fuck am i doing here and uh you know i i ran away from that shit as soon as i tapped hoyler in abu dhabi i'm like you know what i'm gonna do jujitsu fuck this comedy shit so i just ran away from comedy and uh but i never stopped writing Never stop putting ideas down together. I said, one day I'm going to go back and do some st stand up one day. And then year after year after year, I never went back up. And then uh, Sam, who I knew from the old days when I used to hang out with Joe at the comedy store back in 2000, 2001, 2002, Sam, you know, he said, hey, dude, if you ever want to do comedy again, I'll put you on my show. He was doing Tuesday nights at the comedy store. Uh, uh, comedy chaos and i was like damn i don't know it's been so fucking long i don't know and sam is sam was fucking pushing me and i said okay fuck it i'll try it once and i went back up man and and i haven't looked back and me and sam been on the road doing tinfoil hat comedy shows all over the country we got tallahassee coming up uh june like 17th or 18th something like that and then jacksonville the next day so we're doing tallahassee and jacksonville back to back my brother from another mother. Here he is, Sam Triple. How you doing, Sam? Brother, how are you? I'm so excited to be on your new podcast, dude. <laughs> hey, man. And the reason why I'm having you on, not because, not only because I love you, but when we're on the road and we're like, you know, in Ubers and we're, you know, at the airport, we're always talking about the same shit. Like, <laughs> like which move, like what, we just pick a movie. And we're like, okay, what is the Illuminati purpose of this movie? Because it's pretty fucking obvious now. Yeah. That all uh, like gigantic movies have some kind of deep state purpose. Right. And, you know, and I always talk about like, uh, for sure, the zombie genre. Zombies are so huge. Zombies are huge. And, and it's so obvious what the zombie genre is for. It's to push the threat of contagion, the fear of contagion. Ooh, it's going to spread. And it's like the, the worst possible thing you can get. Being a zombie is worse than getting fucking leprosy. It's yeah. worse than getting fucking herpes on your fucking face. Yeah, it's, being a zombie is the worst. So they get the worst Do shit. Do zombies get STDs? That's a real question, bro. <laughs> What's worse than Did being a zombie? Get a gonorrhea and shit. Dude, zombies, zombies are worse 
than being dead. It's better to get some disease and die than to get some disease in your 100 percent. Like, it's always about some some like bio lab that loses it and everybody goes nuts. It's and like, then everybody needs the vaccine. Oh, yeah. we got to get the vaccine. It's all about the vaccine. And it's in like a green vial. And then, oh, the vaccine is going to save everybody. Some dude gets out and bites everybody. For sure. You know, what's so interesting is like when you look back at a lot of the, the movies, they had to get, they were just more clever at how they got it out. Now it's just like either the writers are shitty or something and they just, it's just so much more blatant now. It's like, it's so obvious what they're doing back then. Like you look at you like, Oh my God, that's what they were doing. They were, we were just weren't looking for, it, and they were more clever at how they got the propaganda out. Am I wrong, Jay? It seemed like they were a little more cl- like, and I think that's the opposite of comedy now, right? Like comedy. Now you have to get real clever with how you say some fucking, you know, politically incorrect shit. Whereas before you could come out and just say, now you got to say it in a way where they don't know if you're being a fan. You know, just, like we talk about all the time, Eddie, when we're on the road, we have certain jokes where we're like, I know what you're saying there. And it's really clever because they can't get mad at you for saying it. it's all mind fuck shit. But in movies, it was the opposite way. It's like they, they said the same shit, but it was like super duper intelligent how they gave it away not to arise all the crazy uh, right wing Christians. And now... It just seems like they're either lazy or they just don't care. And they're just hitting you with blatant stuff. I don't know. Is that how you see it, Jay? Some of that for sure. I mean, like if you think back to the sixties, the fifties and sixties, like they had a whole studio, right. That was like 250 of the top directors and producers with secret access that nobody knew about until, you know, Dave McGowan started putting out his material, the Laurel Canyon stuff. And the, the weird part about that was that it the top directors out there, Disney, uh, you had people like the top uh, uh, actors of the time, Jimmy Stewart, like they would they had access to Laurel Canyon Studios and nobody even knows the thousands of the productions that they made. There's a couple things on YouTube that have been kind of declassified as public uh, domain now, which demonstrates that this is all true. And you can see clips of like Jimmy Stewart up there, you know, filming fil- uh, movies for the FBI and whatnot. But what that shows is that like even back to that time like the 50s and 60s there was a totally you know intimate married at the hit relationship between the pentagon uh the cia the intelligence agencies and whatnot and hollywood and it's and it's always been that way to the point of like the some of the biggest directors a-listers did spying on the side a lot of people don't know that but like john ford um, Greta Garbo, uh, Sterling Hayden, uh, Christopher Lee, Christopher Lee, Julia Child worked for the OSS. Uh, Cary Grant crazy, was a spy. Dude. Yeah, Marlene Dietrich, uh, Frank Sinatra was like a FBI informant and a CIA go between. So all of these people were doing their you know stage stuff, their Hollywood stuff, and they're also basically you know tied at the hip to the intelligence agency. So I mean, I, I, when I was doing grad work on this, I thought that shit was crazy. I was like that that's too that's too out there but then you realize when you get deeper and deeper into this at a even just at an academic level not a conspiracy level but like the actual academic research backs up the craziest shit about this stuff like and and it more comes out over time like you know people's biographies come out after they pass away oh yeah by the way they were a spy for the cia and they were <laughs> sleeping with everybody and compromising them i mean it gets into that level eyes wide shut level shit too now, Jay, let's back up a little bit. Can you and take your time with this? Give me I, I am fascinated with the uh, with people's stories of how they uh, opened their eyes and and how they became awake. Because, I mean, when was how old were you when you were still caught in the Matrix? And what was it that that opened your 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 first eye and then the second eye, then the third eye? What was the process? I had a few uh, wild experiences. I mean, I was a crazy, wild party dude in high school. Uh, I was just telling Sam the other day, I was uh, like the wittiest superlative dude. And then uh, we were partying one night and I had a really bad acid trip. And I had a sort of out of body experience where I interacted with this entity. I look back on it now and I think it was probably something, you know, demonic, but that really shook me up. It kind of jolted my world. And that got me into philosophy, asking bigger questions, reading the Bible, you know, that kind of stuff, reading about um, 
some conspiracy stuff. I was first exposed to that when I was about 18 or 19, a lot of stuff to do with Freemasons and uh, the United Nations and communist conspiracies, that kind of stuff. So I got introduced to that a couple of years later after uh, 9-11. I remember watching Burmese's documentary, uh, you know, Loose Change had come out. And then I was first exposed. To, remember E-Bombs World, right? Yes, remember that, that yes. old ass site where. <laughs> yeah. With all the crazy shit, right? All that crazy shit, right? Like two chicks, one cup or whatever that shit was. And then. Yeah. I remember Burmese's a clip from Loose Change popped up and I was like on break at work scrolling through that kind of stuff. And uh, I was like, this is pretty crazy. Like that, that plane doesn't fit that hole in the building on the Pentagon. Right. So something is up with that. And uh, around that same time, I remember stumbling across some really weird fringe website and they had a bunch of Alex Jones clips. And it was Alex when he was still on public access in Austin, he was talking about, uh, Skull and Bones in Bohemian Grove. And I'd never heard, never seen Alex Jones before, but I was watching these little like Windows media clip, you know, that like takes like five seconds or five, five minutes for it to come pop up and start playing. And then here's Alex, Jones, like young Alex Bro, Jones. Alex. was real. <laughs> yeah, dude. They're doing it. They're at Bohemian Grove, folks. The Skull and Bones. And I was like, what is this shit? So I got I started reading babies. about Skull and Bones. <laughs> I read about Skull and Bones. I read about Bohemian Grove. Um, Anytime I would hear a book mentioned, I would buy it. I'm just, I'm a book fiend. My mom was an editor and a librarian. So I grew up just surrounded by books. Uh, so then it was a longer sort of rabbit hole for, of the 9-11 stuff that led me into reading about secret societies that led me into, um, when I went to college, I decided I was going to study either film and philosophy or, the, or both of them together. And so I did that. And I took a, had a lot of film classes on like Oliver Stone movies and a lot of Oliver Stone shit is obviously super conspiratorial so we got deep into that and comparing it to the real historical events and where it was on where it was off uh kept listening to alex consistently like i, I was like a hardcore alex jones listener from 2003 on like i would download you know like every podcast back in the day um and he was back then like he was talking about stuff that you'd never heard of like he was talking about false flags uh, he was talking about how intelligence agencies would co-op people and just throwing out all this like really pretty high level stuff for for the quality of the content that was out there back in 2000. Remember the Google video days? Like you'd be scrolling yeah. through Google video and they would have like lectures of crazy conspiracy theorists. So I, I went into all that, um, but I wanted to do it at an academic level. So uh, I did my grad work on uh, Ian Fleming, James Bond, <clears throat> and how all of that ties into him writing into his uh, Bond stories, not just propaganda, but a lot of techniques of psyops, a lot of uh, real operations that he was involved in. Because a lot of people don't know that he was a real life spy that did a lot of stuff during World War With the II. guy, the guy that wrote uh, James Bond, the guy who wrote yeah. it, did he direct it too, or did he just write it? No, he just wrote the stories, and then like, but. Hollywood came to him and they were like, you know, we, we could make this into like a big, it could be the first iconic kind of uh, franchise that would be used for propaganda. So, I mean, there were movies that had been made that were, that were propaganda way before that, like back in the twenties and thirties, they were already using Hollywood for propaganda purposes. Like Howard Hughes's films were, were war propaganda films, but but they really upped the game with Bond because what Bond was, was like the next level of psyops through Hollywood. And it was the first time they really did that on a global scale, pushing a specific narrative that the establishment wanted. Which so was that's what? kind of what it was. Yeah, it go gl ahead. Just glorifying uh, uh, intelligence. intelligence. They're spies. everywhere They're They can't stop you. So uh, what, a long time yeah. ago, I, w I used to do USOs. I've told the story before, but I think it fits here. Like I went with Brian Callen, Dove Davidoff, and Steve Byrne to Afghanistan. And we had this really great uh, lead. Uh, this guy who was like retired military and was working through the USOs. And he was telling me a story that um, that in World War One, I, I think it was, that they had done studies and found that soldiers couldn't shoot the enemy they wouldn't do it they felt bad they didn't want to do it so they decided to start putting gun deaths in like gunshot and people shooting and killing people in the movies to normalize shooting and killing people in movies 
Sam Tripley and I are coming to your town. Catch us on the road doing tinfoil hat comedy. Follow me on Instagram at tinfoil hat comedy night. June 17th, we got Tallahassee. And June 18th, Jacksonville. Go to samtripley.com for more information and to buy your tickets. See you on the road. Fast forward to, you know, what happened with a gangster rap and hip hop and that famous meeting that nobody knows if it's real or not about how like all the record execs got hurled into a, uh, herded into a room and told that their companies are owned by the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. And they're going to uh, start pushing gangster rap to glorify this, this uh, lifestyle, which lo and behold, totally happens you hear old rappers talking about how the clubs went from fist fighting to gunshots real quick so i believe all of that so uh jay um when you're talking about um uh world war uh one and world war two propaganda in film what what was uh the main strategy it, it like is that what is it what sam's saying just to get people used to people shooting other people in, 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 in war or, or what do you got to say? There was a whole bunch of things. So they, they, for decades, the military and intelligence apparatus was experimenting at different levels in different ways. So, so one level, like there's the product placement, which everybody knows about that, right? That's, that's the most obvious version of this that we can see where, um, bond, the bond franchise, for example, was one of the first to really start pushing certain brands in the movies and they did it as an experiment to see how well it would work. And so when James Bond is pushing, you know, this kind of um, uh, drink, you know, he's drinking this, this uh, martini, all of a sudden like, everybody wants to drink that. All of a sudden like, everybody wants an Aston Martin, the, the car he drives. So that was very successful. And they realized that it could be used at a more sophisticated level for um, messages and ideologies. So they could put into the narratives, for example, I think that the Bond movies, uh, they seed the idea of the war on terror decades before there was any war on terror. Um, and they, they had planned, the deep state had planned that there would be after the Cold War, a war on terror. And that was really in, uh, put into practice in Vietnam. If you, There's a really good book on this uh, by Douglas Valentine called The Phoenix Program, where he goes into how they tested a lot of these psyops in Vietnam that would later be rolled out on a global lev uh, level with the war on terror. That was the whole thesis of his book is that Vietnam was an experiment in rolling out what would be the police state and the, like the FEMA fusion centers and all that kind of stuff. Um, that again was, it was pioneered in Vietnam. Um, and so it's the same apparatus that's, that was running that fake uh, controlled opposition war. And it's the same apparatus in the cold war, in my view, that was doing a lot of high level. Um, I mean, I'm not saying the Cold War wasn't real, like it was real people out there on the ground, you know, engaging in these these uh, espionage activities and whatnot. But at a higher level, you have a, a, a plan to utilize these things for long term purposes. So what they started doing with film was all kinds of experiments to see what um, if you could change people's um, views of morality, if you could change people's views of, like Sam said, how to dehumanize an opponent or an enemy, which they had already experimented with that decades before. There was a H.G. Wells, the famous uh, sci-fi writer, like he was the first big propagandist to figure out how to demonize an enemy through artwork and posters. So he would just, everybody from Eurasia, he would demonize them as like this mon mongrel. And it was very successful in the in the poster campaigns. And then Bernays, uh, the father of propaganda, borrowed a lot of those techniques from H.G. Wells and his science fiction. And Hollywood was doing the same thing at the same time. So basically, it's not just Hollywood, but media itself is actually a product of uh, the OSS and wartime intelligence and how they would use a lot of techniques, for example, out of advertising. So a lot of the admin that came from military intelligence and the OSS, they immediately went to be the heads of the networks, the CBS, ABC, NBC. They were all staffed by people that were like psyops masters in the time of uh, World War II. So there's a whole bunch of different examples and phases of this, but if you want a World War II example, uh, Hitchcock was, he did, he shot tons of propaganda film for the British Ministry of Information, which was another, um, office of basically psyops and intelligence 
uh, for war propaganda. So everybody knows who Alfred Hitchcock is, but not many people know that he was doing war propaganda. Um, they also studied the techniques of how people reacted to Psycho when Norman Bates, you know, like they didn't even show it, but it was enough at that time when he was like stabbing people that people were running out of the theater. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a tame movie by today's standards, but yeah. they were studying the effects of that kind of stuff, the trauma on audiences when they, when they see that kind of stuff. So there's so many different levels and layers to what the social engineers and the psyops experts have seen the potential for movies in Hollywood to do. We're seeing that in uh, China right now in real time from what their TikTok shows, their population to their, uh, and like basically wiping up feminine men off of all their pop culture to their movies. Now the bad guys are Americans. The one they get away with the, you know, the, 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 the Chinese people have to, you know, stop the bad guys. The bad guys are Americans. And we, we see it happening in, in, you know, real time. And, you know, you know, when people talk about Chinese credit score, that's not a Chinese thing. They didn't invent that. It was actually U S intelligence that was yeah. brought over there to, to work out the kinks. And then now that it's got something, they're going to try to bring it over here to right. the best of their abilities. I, when I hear that, when I hear that it was in a, uh, an American experiment at, uh, uh, conducted in China, it makes me feel like I, there's a little more hope, right? It's or a makes you proud. Go right. Like I'm like, they're, they're testing it. They're, they don't really, they're not sure about it. Thank God. Cause they do a lot of shit. They do a lot of shit. They, they, they pull the plug on a lot of shit where they go with it for a week and then they go, you know what? Bad idea. Boom. Remember, remember flu Rona. <laughs> remember flu fucking Rona that yeah. lasted for a Rona. week. Rona. Like, cause, cause, cause they knew, cause once they admitted, once they admitted the CDC, the who FDA, once they admitted that the fucking test we've been using this whole goddamn time can't tell the difference between the flu and fucking COVID. And it turns out that same test was always a flu test. When they finally admitted that shit, they knew that the flu numbers were going to come back and they were going to have to somehow bring the flu back. But but slowly, you can't just switch it over. So they someone thought someone in the deep state go, you know what? I think a good idea would be flu Rona. We'll just say it's a combo of both for a while. Oh yeah. And well, they, they like to see it. what they can get away they with. They pushed it. Yeah. And then I bet fucking Klaus Schwab fucking blew a fuse and said, who the fuck is going with flu Rona? Cause everybody laughed immediately. Everybody go, what flu Rona? That gave, that gave the flu Rona is a shark so NATO of diseases. Yeah, right. <laughs> they pulled the fucking plug on flu Rona. I bet the guy that, that pushed that, that didn't clear it with Klaus Schwab first. I bet that guy's probably fucking, he's probably he got some cement shoes on in the fucking Bermuda Triangle or some shit. <laughs> that guy's done, dude. They took back his island. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he had to give back his island. That guy's gone. He no, I think Sam, uh, Sam, you're. Sam's right. Like the, I think sometimes they, they come up with the most retarded possible idea and they see if they can get away with it. Right. Like throw that one out and see if they'll buy that shit. Right. Yeah, they are yeah. just seeing how far we can go. And it's yeah. all based on this data points off your phone. That's why yeah. they went into Philadelphia first and tried to bring back masks because the data showed that they're, I hate to say it Philly. Cause I love you, but you're in your weak men make hard times phase. And they knew that. So they're like, let's try to bring back mass here. And it failed miserably. Yeah, and that failed big time. Big time, dude. Big time. And they they keep trying to do it. Well, I was thinking about you today, Eddie, when I was at the park with my kids. And I looked around and it was so funny because it was like 180 from like two years ago where like I looked around and there was a couple people with masks on and most people did not have masks on. Like two years ago, everybody had masks on. A couple people didn't have masks on. It's like this weird kind of flip that's happened. Yeah. That is almost like, are we in a bizarro timeline right now? Because it's so completely different. And I, I just want to interview people like, why are you still wearing the mask? Like, what is what is keeping that mask on? But I thought it was really interesting. Like, the indoctrination is so strong right now. It's strong as hell. And they've been doing mass and they've been doing little mini pandemics in Asia forever. Yeah. That's what they do. They do 
pandemics all the goddamn time. When I'd, when I'd go to Asia, I'd see dudes with masks all the goddamn time. They always had masks. They're, they got they got that culture down yeah. with the masks. Right. So you see them here in the United States. Uh, a good percentage of the people still wearing masks in the United States are Asians because that's their culture. Right. They got them yeah. good. <laughs> now, now let me ask you. A, a, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna have uh, random questions coming out. But what do you think? What was the purpose of the little rascals? <laughs> that that uh, couldn't be. That that had I to have remember a purpose, the little right? rascals. I think mean, about little rascals. Even if you never thought about it before, off the you top of your head, rascals, what's the bro? What was the thing you say? Give me deep state, little like, rascal. Uh, the 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 deep state and, uh, purpose for buckwheat. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> you you threw me for a loop there. Um, Without any kind of any kind of child trafficking type thing with little rascals. <laughs> okay, okay, we can go with that. Think about angle. it. No, yep. maybe bunch of kids. Uh, like, weren't they? Are they like they orphans? They're like orphans. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's that. like yeah, it, yeah. it's normalizing okay. orphans, making orphans cool. It's okay to be an orphan. These kids didn't have parents, right? Little rascals didn't. I'm just thinking of this shit right now. Okay. It could be normalizing orphans. <laughs> well, I I think back then, like the abuse in Hollywood was just as prevalent as it is now, but people didn't have any way to express that there was no recourse. Right. So, you know, some shit happened to Shirley yeah. Temple, you know, yeah, exactly. You no, know I was going to say Shirley no Temple. Way yeah. did. Darla, dude, Darla, whew, she was probably on drugs at 12. Well, they said that, uh, Judy Garland, right. They, they always talk about how she was like drugged up. Then she just basically had to leave, live on set. Right. She couldn't leave the set controlled by her handlers there's a movie that kind of hints at this not with her but just in general that coen brothers movie uh, hail caesar i think if you remember the josh brolin character he's like the fixer so he like keeps everybody in line and covers up you know the murders and he he does all that kind of shit like organized crime would play that role for a lot of people in hollywood um and organized crime has a lot of you know tie-ins to uh cia and all that stuff too in the history of hollywood but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some crazy shit going on. The thing about this is rascals. I just want to say real quick, uh, Eddie, you know, I, I don't know if when the, the the little rascals were going, if the system was implemented as much. Like, because I think everything changes when Kennedy gets shot. And, you know, that's when the CIA brings over. That's when the Dulles brothers bring in over the Nazis. That's when we start seeing the propaganda. That's when we see the Bush takeover and the Bush death cult start to seep everywhere. So I'm not saying there wasn't propaganda way back in the day, but I just don't know if it was the same organization that has got everything on lockdown right now. Right? My, I, don't, I, I, I don't know shit. I wasn't back there. But to me, it seems like... Uh, TV and the, and the movie industry was made to propagandize. I don't think it was just some organic thing like some filmmakers making movies and then it later got hijacked. I think when it comes to TV and movies, I think, and I, I could be totally wrong. I just come to the conclusion based on what I know, gun to my head, I would say, TV was created to propagandize. Movies were created, the movie business was from day one, this is how we're going to get them. We're going to get them all in a little room and we're going to just show a screen. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure we're, I mean, we're, we're think about um, the reefer madness propaganda yeah. with, uh, with weed. That was in the thirties and that was straight up. Just the craziest propaganda, the most blatant, like they would show, like they were, there was, dude, there was silent films that demonized weed. Like they would have someone smoking weed. In the yeah. silent film, and then like bust out guns, start shooting people and shit. So <laughs> that was in the 30s. So I think from day one, I, it, it's uh, it's been under control. That's my. I, I think the fucking the Three Stooges. I got to think about that. What is the, what is the deep state purpose behind Three Stooges? <laughs> There's got to be something, right? <laughs> is it possible that they not? I'm totally not going against what you're saying right now, but is it possible? that the needs of the state were, were were different at that time. If you're trying to build up 
America into a national, uh, international power? Don't you kind of want them to be doing certain things compared to now, which is like trying to destroy that same power? I'm just thinking out loud here that like, because if we're like, what is the, what is, what is the uh, deep state of welcome back Carter? I don't, I don't, I like, like dude, I bet it? you there is dog. Don't <laughs> what laugh at is that. it, dude? I don't, like, is there something like, what is it? Sweat hogs or farm animals? <laughs> I don't know. Dude. It's like, what was the weirdness? So, I mean, anything's possible. Dude, dude those but. guys were, was that high school? Was welcome back Carter yeah, high yeah, school? Yeah, those yeah, guys yeah. are like 35. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh yeah. You remember Jay, what do you think? When, when did, when, when do you think, uh, the propaganda really started to hit in Hollywood. So I think both of you guys are right to a degree because there are some of the earliest film footage was intended for like military propaganda purposes. Some of the earliest blockbusters from the twenties were war propaganda, like hell's angels by uh, the, the Howard Hughes film. Um, so they saw the potential for that early on. Of course, Hitler himself also utilized uh, movies and film for a lot of propaganda back in the 30s, 40s. And then at the time, of, by the time of World War II, it ramped up to the next level where they were playing propaganda reels before every movie, right? So, uh, and then at the same time, there was a huge interplay that like new information about this, like is still coming out. Like this, the field of, academics analyzing the history of Hollywood and propaganda. It's actually fairly new, like in terms of academic people writing about it. Um, there's not that many books out there about it. And so the people are discovering new relationships that, that nobody even knew about. That's why when, you know, Dave McGowan was talking about Laurel Canyon, that was such a big revelation. I had, I was already almost done with my book when I read Dave's book. I had to go back and like add that to the first chapter because it was so relevant to what I was writing about in Esoteric Hollywood. But um, it ramps up. And then when you get those people coming out of the wartime intelligence apparatus and then being the heads of the networks, when they came out with the networks, that was a huge like next level of propaganda. And then the Cold War, again, is like took it to a, the next level. So Hollywood just kind of kept going more and more and more into the domain of propaganda. And yeah, after a JFK, for sure, like it ramped up because that took the Cold War to the next level because people thought that was uh, Oswald, which obviously it wasn't, but it was blamed on a Soviet, right? It was blamed on a, on a communist, supposedly, um, to feed into the Cold War narrative. All the Bond films, for the most part, take place in the in, during a Cold War narrative. All of that was pushing Cold War stuff. And it was also pushing the ideology of the West. Like, James Bond is supposed to be the preeminent icon of, like, the Western dude that doesn't get... He's just a killing machine with no morals at all. And he's a, he's a pure consumerist. That's why he's all obsessed with the best watch, the best car, the best women. Um, but he has no heart, no feeling at all. And that's what Western ideology wanted to project against the Soviet idea of communism, collectivism. I'm not seeing either one. Or, they're both bad in my view. Like they're both extremes that were being used as a dialectical controlled opposition. But James Bond is the is the icon of the Western um, Nietzschean Ubermensch, um, beyond good and evil killing machine. Right. Uh, but then the irony is that in the novels, like he's a miserable person. He himself, like he says, he's miserable. He can never find, can never connect with anybody. So he's just like a totally nihilistic, um, monster actually in the novels. Right. And he's miserable. And the irony is that that's what the people who run the West wanted to turn the West into was a bunch yep. of atomized, materialistic uh just totally um self-absorbed people that can't have any connections with any other people yeah so he's he's an image of the atomization that they wanted to create in the west uh and that's why he's he's so useful for propaganda they they didn't just do it with like music and film they did it with like art art like real art like even yeah. like uh painting people famous right. painters um famous philosophers uh authors norm chomsky was part of this group yep. uh i forget what they call operation something where they wanted to push artists who questioned the u.s government and what they did so it made it look like th that capitalism was more open-minded to anti-authority than right. communism 
yeah, there was a CIA project called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. There's a whole book by academic uh, CIA and the Cultural Cold War. And they funded Jackson Pollock. They funded yeah. Andy Warhol, all those people to create just garbage art, like people vomiting <laughs> on can, literally, like like just pee on a canvas, uh, you know, vomit on the canvas, all of that kind of shit. That's straight up funded by the CIA, 100%. Now, um, obviously, in the, you know, in the 50s, but I grew up in the 80s, and um, the propaganda that I remember the most in the 80s was that Russia, they're all red. It looks like Mars. Uh, they're every, all these people are watching you like in, like KGB. They got black trench coats and a hat and they watch everything you do and they're so evil. What what um, how did what was Russia, Russian propaganda um, about the U.S.? Like what did what did they because they for sure had propaganda and made us look did, like, yeah. like 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 Satan, right? Do you, there's some actually some pretty awesome YouTube clips you can pull up. You can find ones of uh, propaganda exposés that they would run, that they would run on air in Soviet Russia back in the 80s. And I'm not saying it's I'm not I'm not Soviet. Or I'm not pro communist. I think both sides again of that are are bad news. But if you watch those documentaries about American propaganda, they're totally accurate. Like it's all about the shit, this, the stuff we're talking about, right? Again, that doesn't mean that the communist Soviet system is good. It's not. It was a nightmare. But the both of these systems are materialistic, atheistic, nihilistic systems. One of them is about, oh, just uh, follow your own base desires and be a, a coom pod consumerist. And then the other one is, oh, worship the state, worship your daddy figure, Stalin, worship Khrushchev, uh, the collective, you know, cosmic uh, Soviet state will take us to, you know, a space based utopia like Star Trek, right? Um, so it was two different mythologies that were clashed together, but they do call out in their propaganda the fact that we're run by a corporate elite. We are programmed to be uh, basically mindless consumers, right? We're mind controlled. All of that shit was true, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying communism or Sovietism is good. But uh, that was the propaganda that they were that the KGB was uh, beaming out to the Russians. We got a video, Hitler, can you play We got, we just pulled a Russian propaganda. Yeah, that's probably it. Our TV can always be trusted. I would never trust American TV, all those channels and different programs. In recent years, the Soviet media has said much about the American way of life, and its portrait of America is a dark one. It is designed to convince the Soviet people that our social system is anything but desirable. It emphasizes violence, drug abuse, unemployment, and overall exploitation of the American people by the government. Since the average Soviet citizen has no alternative source of information about the United States, the Soviet version is probably accepted at face value. The Soviet people, however, seem to be curious about America and impressed by its material success. Last summer, Pravda published a lengthy article entitled Incurable Disease, which dealt with U.S. unemployment and bank failures. About the same time, Moscow was saying that there are 40 million Americans who are literally starving, while a select group of capitalists continues to get richer. Moscow Television celebrated the 4th of July last year by assuring viewers that America is the quintessence of an unjust capitalist system that keeps millions of families living below the official poverty line. The unemployed are described as having been deprived of the right to work, while Moscow Television shows film of locked factory gates and people being evicted from their homes. The message in all this is that the capitalist system in America is unfair and is, in fact, a failure at providing for basic human needs or maintaining continued national growth. This broadly distorted statement is aimed at convincing the Soviet people that Soviet communism works much better by providing economic security for them. The U.S. economy, as described by the Soviet media, is being driven by raging militarism. 
Defense spending is reported to be the cause of unemployment in civilian industries, and also the cause of the huge federal deficit. The Soviet Defense Ministry newspaper Red Star says that American young people are receiving militarist brainwashing from films like Rambo. Also included as malicious and distorted are Telephone, a film about a KGB assassin on the job in the U.S., and Red Dawn, which depicts an invasion of Colorado by Cuban and Soviet troops. Nice. <laughs> That's actually true. Like, all, all of those movies that were mentioned actually were pro uh, Pentagon propaganda movies. They, they make, no uh, lie detected. No lie detected. I mean, yeah, they make uh, they make the United States look like what we think is happening in Venezuela, right? Exactly. They're just showing like you know bad parts of the inner city, and you know they think like the whole country's the whole country's, the like whole country's that. that way, right? <laughs> well, there's a lot of truth to it. I mean, when they talk about how we're a lot of stuff is suffering here yeah. because of how much money we spend on our military, that's 100 percent true. I mean, 100 percent true. People are like people are going broke more in America than ever. That's 100 percent true. Now, if you're asking me if I can pick between capitalism and communism i'll take capitalism every day yeah but i mean i didn't detect a lot of lies in there i mean i mean it's just like sometimes when you put a mirror up to yourself you kind of go what the fuck and you know for me like i i can i can differentiate between the american people and the american government just like i can do it with like the russian people and the russian government and where was the lie in a lot of that stuff? The propagandize and all that shit. I'm giving you all the tracks. You become, you gotta make the playlist. All right, I'm just showing you all the different songs. You, you uh, arrange them the way you want. That's all it is. So when you're playing quarter guard, you only have one way. You can go dogfight, or you could go deep half stuff. You could do that shit too. Like if I have this right here, I could go to dogfight. Right, I can go from up here and attack. This is like a tug of war grip right here. This is a burrito grip Bam. here. And then from here, so to get that under, he's not letting me get the under, but if I can get a hold of a two on one burrito grip here and then shoot up and pin it and get up on my elbow here. And then I'm gonna go bam and just dive in and grab this. And then once I'm here, I'm gonna half plex him, make him base and then bring that knee up, boom. If you can't get the lockdown, fuck it, but you got quarter guard, get that underhook. Start battling the wrist. Get that up. Boom. Did that help? I mean, like, usually there's some sort of truth in what, I mean, at least maybe not in the 80s when we were still all making money here, but if we take that to what's going on right now, seems like that's what's going on. Now, Jay, um, um, <clears throat> you mentioned Dave McGowan uh, earlier, and I've talked about him before. He wrote the book Weird Scenes in Laurel Canyon. And for those of you that have never heard of it or, or heard of him, it's basically a book about the 60s, Laurel Canyon, basically, in, uh, you know, in Hollywood, uh, that whole area. It's like um, uh, a community that lives in the hills, right, you know, in the middle yeah. of Hollywood. And the street, the main street that runs through it is Laurel Canyon. And that's actually the name of the area, too. And the book basically um, talks about how in the 60s, um, a lot of that, the 60s music, a lot of the hippie music that came from Laurel Canyon had uh, connections to a secret military base right there in Laurel Canyon called, called Lookout Mountain Laboratories, which right. was actually the, uh, the most sophisticated movie studio at the time. And right. uh, the official story is that they were making... Uh, they were filming nuclear bombs yeah, blowing did, up yeah. and they were analyzing right. them. But really in, in Dave McGowan's talking about, you know, you know, he's, he's focusing more on the music, but right. um, the fact that there was all these American intelligence officers in that area living there, they had families, they had kids. And when they, it just so happens to be uh, coincidentally that all these bands that came out of nowhere, right. Mamas and the Papas, even you know, the Doors, all these bands, so many, the list goes on and on, that they had 
people in the bands that were were directly related to these uh, intelligence officers, like their kids. Yeah. And when you look at these bands, they didn't struggle. They had no demos. They immediately got pushed. And um, and then you find out that there was, you know, for a big portion of those bands in the 60s, there was really one band doing all the music. They're called the Wrecking Crew. Wrecking Crew, yeah. And they were doing all the music. Like, music was so fake in the 60s. And I always knew there was, like, there was a reason I was never really into 60s music. I mean, I like Jimi Hendrix. I like, uh, you know, Black Sabbath and some, but most, most 60s music, I just did not vibe with. I started like in 70s music. Uh, but um, so Dave McGowan wrote this book about all these connections. And he's basically saying that the hippie movement um, musically was uh, uh, quite possibly based on all the connections, some kind of CIA, PSYOP, FBI, yeah. PSYOP to uh, what? To discredit the, the, the anti-war movement, right? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the, the key purposes, according to Dave. I think he's right about that. I think there was a lot of things going on. I mean, they were experimenting with new types of psychological warfare. They were experimenting with new types of um, ways to live. So a lot of the hippies and the communal living, they were, they were trying to prep people for where they wanted to take us when they bring in the New World Order, when they bring in austerity. Um, and, and you can find high-level white papers talking about using counterculture creating and steering counterculture to engineer future generations to accept things like the great reset accept things like uh you know what what, what the world economic forum says now you'll own nothing you'll have nothing you'll be happy right uh i mean klaus literally just said we will hack your bodies you will own nothing you will be happy i mean this is all the same attitude of like communal hippies and they weren't, they didn't come up with these ideas. They were being told by people working with uh, high level military. A lot of some generals were involved in this. If you watch that documentary, I'd forgotten about this. I just did a, a review on my YouTube channel, of this documentary the other day. Uh, it's called the Unabomber, the internet and LSD. Oh shit. By a, a German dude that made this documentary in like 2003 or four. It's a forgotten documentary, but it's really important because he points out that the the hippies in the Silicon were also connected to the Silicon Valley people, and they had the idea for the internet from DARPA, right? Uh, but it wasn't hippies that came up with this. It was like the military industrial complex was talking to a lot of these hippies and, and seeding these ideas amongst these groups and doing experiments. And that's why Tim Leary, there's a clip, you can pull it up on YouTube, where he's like, if you want to thank anybody for the 60s counterculture he says thank the, the the cia because they were the ones giving not just the people at like the music festivals and the laurel, laurel canyon scene but uh owsley stanley was giving at the direction of the cia giving the grateful dead four million tabs of lsd throughout their uh concerts yeah. Yeah, dude, one hundred percent. Duncan. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to. Time. I'm not trying to be preachy. Like, I, I mean, I've done a lot of acid plenty of times, but I'm saying that like the purpose of it being given out was an experiment to see how it changed people, how they went, and and what they had done. On this, this sounds sounds kind of crazy, but they studied indigenous tribes and they studied like shamanism, and they wanted to see how they could create a culture where people would submit to the pop culture figure or the social engineers or whatever, like a ritual initiation and the submission to a shaman. So that the, the MK Ultra project is literally kind of birthed out of like shamanism, like Carlos Castaneda stuff. And how can we get people to be total mind control slaves of, of the culture that we create? And so I think, yeah, you're right. A lot of people who were in that scene were legitimate anti-war people. But a lot of people weren't, and they were just created wholesale uh, out of, like you said, like if you were, uh, I'm trying to remember the bands. It was like the Monkees, the Birds, Beach Boys, Mamas and Papas, Wrecking Crew did all the studio music. I mean, they would they would play sometimes publicly, but the studio music was all the Wrecking Crew, right? And that's because these these bands had to kind of be propped up. And by the way, they were promoted by some of the big record labels they were promoted by time magazine which was the skull and bone cia run magazine by henry loose yeah i mean he was he was featuring the counter chronos is time black cuba saturn yeah i think they were doing that on purpose right and i mean i heard you uh i was listening to one of your podcasts the other day 
Eddie, where you were talking about Zappa. I, I, I'd forgotten that Dave talks about Frank Zappa's dad worked at the Edgewood Arsenal, uh, which is a biowarfare lab. And it's the same lab connected to Dow chemicals that created STP, which is this like horrible drug that a bunch of people took and went crazy on, but it was his dad that was like involved in that. Uh, and he, I think he was part of that great right, culture creation scene too. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so crazy that Jim, you know, the whole Jim Morrison. Story, oh yeah. Admiral Morrison. That, yeah. That, Bill Fatonkin, right. That his Jim Morrison's dad, First of all, Jim Morrison, I mean, I, this I could be totally wrong, but this is what Dave McGowan was saying. Jim Morrison di- wasn't like your typical rock star where right. he grew up wanting to be a rock star. He was writing a lot of poetry in school. He, he knew he wanted to sing. He, he, he was just a, um, a regular guy with no rock star aspirations. And all of a sudden, according to Dave McGowan, he's this big rock star. And coincidentally, and, you know, coming from L.A. in the Laurel Canyon, coincidentally, his dad, no one disputes this so far, his dad orchestrated the Gulf of Tonkin, which was yep. the, fla- the false flag that got us into Vietnam. Isn't that a fucking coincidence? If that's yeah. true, maybe it's not true. But, damn, I haven't heard anybody say it's not true. It is true, though. Yeah, it's true, and yeah. If you take a look at what's going on in modern day today, how many times do we find out that somebody famous, their uncle, their father, their mother, their cousin is famous? There's always a there's always a story. It's never just like very rarely, and I know a couple people, but very rarely at the highest levels does it does it just come mostly actors i think stand-up comics i know a couple people like sebastian maniscalco's parents are just immigrants and leslie jones and tiffany haddish you know they didn't they, they didn't have any connections but maybe i'm wrong but you know there's I don't hear it on that, but most of these people, like uh, Jennifer Aniston's mother was a famous um, casting director. And then there's like, you go through like celebrities who are military brats. They're everywhere and, and they love to blow them up because those people grew up in military families where like everything's about following orders and doing the best for your government and all that stuff. Right. And it just happens over and over. But I find it very interesting. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts is as the internet becomes more and more powerful and the legacy media starts to die, like, is it going to be easy for them to blow these people up anymore? I don't know, man. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, the one thing that trips me out is it's not just what you're saying, Sam, totally true. Um, all these connections, like, uh, you know, Anderson Cooper is from like, isn't he from like the, the Vanderbilt? Vanderbilt. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, it could be like, hey, you know what? People are just hooking each other up. It's all about who you know. Your parents hook you up. It's no big deal. You want to hook up your kids. I get that, too. But then you have like Bill Gates and, and his parents. You know what I mean? You look into Bill Gates parents like, oh, shit. Like, wasn't wasn't his Bezos. mom? Isn't his mom like didn't she have something to do with the founding of Planned Parenthood or something? Yeah. His dad. Yeah. Oh, his dad. And his, his dad, dad was was, a Genesis, his dad right? ran the, um, central bank of Washington. His mother was very high up at IBM where he basically got his, his, uh, pro, uh, what's it called? His, um, his system for his computers. I forget what the exact word is, but, uh, he got that from her. I mean, like I look at the, the, the Microsoft, logo is a swastika i mean it's already fucking there dude it's like his operating system there it is um so- the weird thing about the laurel canyon scene and, and it's, it's the same with hollywood what what i did in my book with hollywood dave did with in his book with a lot of uh music scene but that overlaps with hollywood too like you have all of these people that are supposed to be counterculture that are against the system against the establishment but almost all of the really important players in that laurel canyon scene come from not just high level military families or government connected families, but like intelligence families. That's the weird part. It's like, it's a lot of people who, you know, have these high level intelligence connections like Bruce Dern, <clears throat> that family. Uh, he had, a, it was, I can't remember if it's the thought, like the granddad or whoever it was, but somebody was like uh, the department of state head of the department of state in the Dern family. And then they have uh, skull and bones in that family too. So Bruce Stern's uncle, that's who it was, Archibald McLeish, McLeish was 
uh, Skull and Bones was a uh, high level State Department. Dennis Hopper, everybody knows who Dennis Hopper was crazy Frank in Blue Velvet, right? His dad was OSS. Um, Stills of Crosby, Stills and Nash, he did black ops stuff in Vietnam for the CIA, special forces operations. Um, I mean, it goes on and on and on to what to the point where it's like it's almost like all these people who are the who become the the, the figures of the counterculture. The weird part about it is that what they're counterculture, but they come from not just military or government government connected families, but military intelligence families. That's the weird part about it. that's the thread that seems to run through this. Like the Dern family, uh, Bruce Stern's uncle Archibald McLeish was Skull and Bones. Dennis Hopper's dad was in the OSS. Stills of Crosby, Stills and Nash was uh, CIA uh, special operations in Vietnam. And so it, it gets to the point where uh, the Rand Corporation through Alfred Walshutter, he was having meetings in um, Laurel Canyon studying this counterculture scene. Now, I mean, the Rand Corporation is the most establishment type of thing you could think of, the, one of the top think tanks in the world. It basically created modern America. It, it was the brains behind the entire Cold War. Why would they be studying the counterculture scene in the in Laurel Canyon if this was an organic, you know, thing that came about on its own? But I mean, there's just so many connections that at a high level that I think I think Dave's overall thesis is correct. Now, one thing uh, that's that's um, uh, such a hot topic these days is Elon Musk. Now, um, it, it's what are are his parents connected to any kind of deep state stuff? Oh. I know I, all I know is they own like like a gem mine or something in South Africa or something like that. That's all I know, right? So the thing that I know about that is just that his granddad was a technocrat. Like so he was part of the technocracy party and might have even founded it, something like that. So in that regard, I mean he comes from a family that believes in technocracy to run things. But, uh, you know, I, mean, I think everybody knows about Tesla, PayPal, all that kind of stuff kind of getting to where I don't think any of those corporations get to where they are without there being like the approval of the military industrial complex, basically. Um, so to that extent, I mean, he has that connection, that background. I mean, what I don't know what his motives are, what he's really trying to do. I don't have any any hard opinion on that, but. The closest thing that I could say is that to, to it being conspiratorial is just that his granddad was part of the technocracy party. His dad, his granddad, uh, went through Africa and um, was searching for Nephilim and and Anunnaki, bro. Really? Like, really? That's what, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Very famously was hmm. like on this search for the Anunnaki. <laughs> that could be uh that a psyop within a psyop though you know psyops on psyops yeah dog. i mean you know me dog <laughs> it, there's all kind of uh, space is a psyop that you know me but um now uh what do you think about like the, the one of the most fascinating figures to me in in the history of america is charles manson that story, I mean, it goes so many different ways. I mean, uh, you know, you got the the mainstream story, uh, which is he's satanic and he ordered, uh, you know, his cult to kill uh, Sharon Tate and all those people up at that um, uh, Cielo Drive house. And then he ordered them to kill the, the La Biancas and all that. And that whole mainstream narrative. But then you hear... You know, you know, you know, he was basically um, in he was in jail his whole life. He was accustomed to be in jail. He'd rather be in jail. He's been in and out of prison his whole life. And they used him like one conspiracy theory is the CIA or whoever taught him MK Ultra mind control techniques. Yeah. And used got him out of jail, funded him, and basically, Charles Manson was an uh, an experiment, a, a psyop. Um, where where do you stand with that? No, I totally uh, take that view. I think that um, there's pretty clear evidence that 
at some point he was involved in mind control, uh, especially with the time in prison, because he went through the levels of Scientology to become a theta clear. Um, I think that's a really important piece of information in his in his background, his story that that suggests that I think yeah, that, the, the Scientology connection yeah. is huge. That connects like a whole different dimension right. of conspiracies. And and also the Boys Town connection. Yes. Holy shit. That's a nut that like, damn, like he was in Boys Town. And that's right. like the heart of child trafficking. You know, exactly. right there in Omaha, Nebraska, when you yep. uh, look into the the Franklin cover up, like, holy shit, like Manson was connected to that and Scientology. Like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, so Tom O'Neill's book is good on that. Um, I, th I'm, I think he's pretty much right. Uh, I'm not trying to diss him or anything, but I mean, I thought Manson was a CIA experiment for a long time. Like there was an old book I read. Uh, Sinister Forces, a three-part trilogy. And I think the second or the third part of that was arguing a long time ago. That's actually my publisher, the guy that published my book. He publishes that book too. But that book was arguing that Manson was an MK Ultra CIA project a long time ago too. Um, and I, so I went super deep this last couple of years into the serial killers and how a lot of that connects to Manson. And Manson is actually connected to multiple serial killers. Uh, some of the people that worked with him in terms of Part of that thesis also is that he was in a, like a hitman and his group was working as kind of contract killing for different crime syndicates or for people that needed to be killed. So that's part of what was going on, I think, with the Manson killings is that um, there was snuff stuff, there was drug stuff, uh, and some of that might have come out. And so Manson was told, you know, you need to send some people to take care of this situation so it doesn't get out. Um, I think that's the most uh, sensible explanation. And, and O'Neill in his book, like he talks about a lot of the people in the circles, the direct circles of Manson were working with organized crime. Some of them were connected to the CIA as an assassin, like that Tico guy. Um, some of the people were uh, former OSS who are now like hanging out with Manson. I mean, it's just like too many people in his circles that are like, and how does he suddenly like around like the highest levels of A-listers and you know what I mean? Like, the Beatles know who he is all of a sudden. And the Beatles are hanging out in the Laurel Canyon scene too. They're also part of the Laurel. You Canyon know, scene. one, one story is uh, before I got into the, the CIA theory on Charles Manson, uh -huh. uh, I was, I, I, uh, I read somewhere or saw, I forget where it was, but someone said that the way he got into the Laurel Canyon crew with, you know, all the rock stars and all the A-listers is that he, you know, he's a, uh, he, the mainstream narrative on, on him is he's a master mind as far as mind right. control goes and as far as being like a cult leader and controlling women and all that stuff. So at, before I found out the CIA stuff, he, the story was he would go to, he played guitar and he had some songs and shit. He was a songwriter and he, and he had all these girls that um, around him in his, in his cult and they, they would do whatever he said. And he said strategically to get a record deal, he was going to go hang out in Hollywood, hang out yeah. at the rainbow and f find some rock stars and send his girls over to him, you know, to, uh, you know, basically, you know, get him erections. Right. And then Charles Manson would just stroll over and say, Hey, you know, you meet my girls, you know, you want to party with them. They like, you. Right. let's go party somewhere. And then he, he, he got into uh, the A-list circles uh, by using women and sending his women in. Yes. That's what I heard initially. Th th there might be some truth to that too, but um, I'm totally on board with, he was, yeah. uh, you know, guided by the CIA the whole time. Well, that in that, in that O'Neill book that uh, Sam just had that, that Tom O'Neill on, and he talks about the he names the dudes like he says that there that Tico guy was an a CIA assassin and he hung Tico out. With was suit. Tico was was Tico uh, was I don't remember his name. I just remember Tex. There was a Tex, right? There's Tex Watson. That's Tex Watson. that's part of the immediate circle. But the yeah. if I remember the the dude that Tom O'Neill says introduced Manson to everybody was a guy who was like a known, like high level CIA assassin drug dealer dude. And his, his okay. last name is T-E-K-O. I don't, I don't know if it's Teco or Tico, however you pronounce it, but um, says that he was buddies with Hank Fine, who was an OSS guy. Uh, and together they, the Fine guy sent 
Green uh, Green Acres star, because I wrote this down, Addy Albert to Mexico for uh, assassin and spy work. And then together, this crew is who introduced Manson to these higher level people. So a known, basically a known drug dealer assassin guy is who kind of introduced uh, him and and by the way, tobacco. What you're saying about the the technique with drugs or with girls. So there there was another dude who was the model of Manson, model of Manson or Manson gallon covers named named Vito Paulicas. And Vito was like an experiment in how to create a little pop culture cult like that. And he had he he has all the similarities to Manson before Manson. So he was like this wandering dude. Uh, he had a group of a bunch of groupies around him he would uh uh compromise people with the girls uh he would give them drugs but he never did drugs and you can find interviews with Vito Paulicas he's crazy wild dude but he was like oh I don't do drugs I only give drugs to the chicks right <laughs> it's like he's, he just handles them basically Respect. um he he had the name uh what was like he had a nickname that was really similar to Manson's nickname it was like god of fuck or something like that was his nickname and then manson's was fuck god or something like that like i am the fuck god like i am the one who you know in that sense right and then the the, what eventually came out too was that there was a higher level cult above manson uh 4p which was part of the process church and the process church is the key by the way just a little side note that connects not just manson but also son of sam because son of sam was connected to the process church through this higher level cult. Now, um, it, it seems to me that a, a lot of the serial killers that are the famous ones, anyways, mm-hmm. it seems like the famous ones, the the nationwide uh, smashes, like, you know, um, Ted Bundy, uh, John Wayne Gacy and all that. Um, it seems like they're they're all connected to some kind of psychological operation, some kind of military yeah. intelligence program or something. Right. It seems right. like if you're a famous serial killer, you probably are connected to the deep state. Yeah, man. So like, in, in this book, Douglas Valentine, famous book on, on Vietnam. I couldn't believe it when I read this. I, I mean, so Dave McGowan, right. He wrote a book called program to kill. And his thesis in that book was that, there seems to be a connection between a lot of serial killers and Vietnam wartime service. Right. Yeah. And so he says, well, would there be anything in service in Vietnam that might potentially connect these people to this crazy shit? Like, you know, cannibalism, right. This kind of stuff. I mean, just wild stuff. Why so many Vietnam vets come back acting crazy. They even, I mean, movies even kind of portray this right apocalypse now think about colonel kurtz like he goes nuts he's living out in the middle of the woods you know basically uh in the rainforest or something right he he like creates his own cult out in the rainforest if you remember apocalypse now uh remember dolph lundgren's character in in uh universal soldier he's got an ear necklace right yeah remember that yeah barely barely universal soldier that was yeah van damme and 1993 or something yeah (laughs) But Dolph Lundgren's character is a Vietnam vet who has gone nuts, right? And he, so he's like a crazy cannibal killer who, but here's the thing. So in Douglas Valentine's book, he says that one of the, the ideas that the CIA came up with in the Phoenix program was to train uh, assassins, train uh, SEAL members, train black ops people to go out and do all kinds of ritual murders, including cannibalism eating the organs of the villains uh putting nails into the third eye because this would freak out the Viet Cong when they saw this because they thought the third eye was like a a special symbol right Uh, it it was called it was called the eye of god right to the to the Viet Cong and so it was a form of psyops where they basically train people to be cannibals and that's that's what is is amazing is he admits that so the phoenix program was training kill serial killer cannibals basically and so is it any surprise that these people come back from Vietnam and they would be continually, I mean, they're just nuts basically, but it was a, yeah. it was a government program. It's a say. famous uh, Neil Brennan joke about um, 
what was his name that got uh that punched his girlfriend in the elevator? Ray Rice, wasn't it? Right, yes. Ray Rice. He's like, Oh, you were playing football in the elevator, right? It's like, you know, you're these super violent people at work, and then you go home and you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be able to turn that off, which you should, but not everybody can. So you train these people to kill and right. they come home. And that's what they do. Yeah. That's just what they do. So I think Richard Ramirez, I think uh, the guy that got him into uh, the occult stuff was his uncle or cousin. And I think he was in the Phoenix program. So that's one serial killer that we know was in it. Um, I found old news clippings where it does talk about uh, Son of Sam when he did military service. He did experiment with LSD. We don't know for sure if he was in, in the MK Ultra pro project or not. Uh, Dahmer was stationed 20 um, minutes away from another serial killer in Germany uh, in the 70s. And the German government was invest. They wanted to investigate Dahmer. <laughs> I, I found the news clip. I couldn't believe this. I found the news clipping on this for um unsolved four unsolved murders when Dahmer was stationed in Germany uh and at high level general acts that <laughs> they wouldn't let he wouldn't let the German uh, the German government investigate Dahmer so why is a general like stepping in uh yeah isn't that crazy to protect There's also Dahmer? A famous story of Jeffrey Dahmer while he was in high school calling the president yes. of the United States exactly. while he was on some school trip that's yep. crazy. That's John real. Wayne that's 100% real. Well, he, he, was he it John Wayne uh, Gacy or was it Donald? No, no, no. You're right. It's, it's, uh, he called the office of the VP because they could, the president was gone. So he called the, the VP's office. But that, how, that was Dahmer? That was Dahmer? No, no, no. That was, uh, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. That was Dahmer when he was in high school. So Damn. how, how, why would that do be that, that connected? Right. And he, he got his whole class like access to, to the VP, which is odd, but even crazier is, uh, John Wayne Gacy. He was vetted by the secret service and there's pictures of him with Jimmy Carter's wife. Right. Um, who's the other, I, I'm going blank on my serial killers, but, uh, the one Ted that was Bundy? the happens the, all the time. <laughs> happens all the Ted time. Bundy. Ted Bundy. Yeah, exactly. He was a rising GOP star and um, he was roommates with a state department dude when he was at college. And uh, it's, it's odd, right? I mean, that, that he would be involved in this, but he, he was in, he got in trouble in college for breaking into a Senator's office and stealing documents. We don't know what documents he stole, but he was a political operative for the GOP. A lot of people don't know that about Ted Bundy, but by the way, James, uh, John Wayne Gacy was a very active political operative for the Democrats. So uh, equal opportunity serial killers here on both sides of the, 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 <laughs> the party. I'm not trying to pick a party, but both parties have their serial killers, by the way. Um, but yeah, but Ted Bundy's uh, roommate was um, a high level State Department dude. And then he was tasked with breaking into a professor's office. That professor later became uh, chair of like the CIA intelligence committee or whatever uh mcdermott i think was his name but why would ted bundy future serial killer be breaking into the office of a, of a guy who was in charge of high level senate intelligence stuff within a few years i mean in other words there's all these bizarre things with the serial killers that don't match up to the mainstream story about them by the way a bunch of them are were in satanic cults too which the media doesn't talk about yeah i was about to bring up uh the church of satan with anton Levey and and it, you were talking about Richard Ramirez a little bit ago, and I, man, I, I used to be fascinated with Richard Ramirez. I, I grew up, you know, in LA in the '80s mm -hmm. while this shit was happening. Like, I had relatives, and my mom was like, yeah, just "Stay in, don't go out. He, Richard Ramirez is going to get you." I lived through that shit, and uh, got a little um, you know, fascinated with him. You know, not like I wanted to be like him, but I'm like, "Whoa, this guy's insane." He's like, uh, you know, he's like. I guess uh, girls liked him. Girls, he had like yeah. groupies and shit. They they blew him up, and he was such a vicious killer. Like he he would just like stomp people to death with his boots and and um, 
beat the shit out of people with tire irons and and would like abduct little girls and molest them but wouldn't kill them which is weird wouldn't kill them he'd like drop them off but he old people he beat he killed the shit out of them but like you said his uncle had ties to the military and 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 he was somehow uh, like even though uh, even uh, documentaries that that don't link him to any kind of CIA activity they do all they do say that you know his uncle had a lot to right. do with yeah. uh the way he came out and uh, what he did and his uncle was in the military but they also talk about and I don't know if this is true or not but it comes up that he visited the church of satan once or Correct. twice and, yeah. and knew uh, and like visited with Anton LaVey or whatever yeah what, what do you know about that yeah, no, that's true. So let me think. So check this out. Here's a, I, I found my old notes on this. So son of Sam had uh, connections to the process church, as we said, and uh, that links him to Manson. Zodiac killer uh, would include not just Gnostic, but satanic and OTO symbolism in the letters that he supposedly wrote to the cops and whatnot. Dahmer erected a, an altar uh, that was going to what he called his death altar, or his power altar, where he was going to have the skulls of the victims. Um, by the way, there's also a camera in Dahmer's apartment, which n not many people have talked about that. But he had a video camera set up in the corner, which suggests also um, that a lot of this could be filmed for various purposes. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the people don't ever talk about that in the case of Siroka, but almost all of them have some element of it being filmed. Um, Bundy. Uh, the bodies would have the blood drained out of them. And there were claims of other serial killers that claimed to know Bundy that said that he was involved in uh, ritual abuse. Uh, Manson, as we said, had connections to Scientology and the Process Church, which also connect him to Son of Sam. Henry Lee, Henry Lee Lucas claimed to be part of a Hand of Death cult connected to the Matamoros, uh, where, where they did find um, near the area that he said they would find bodies, the when there was an investigation into the Matamoros cult, they found a shed full of dead bodies. There's that's even mainstream news. You look up, look up that, as you said, Ramirez, uh, church of Satan and meeting with LaVey, uh, BTK killer, uh, his art includes a lot of occult stuff. And he claims to have been possessed by two demons, one called factor X and one called batter, uh, David Parker Ray. That's one of the worst, uh, serial killers. He ran his own personal satanic cult. Uh, then he, he's called the toy box killer, uh, Herb Baumeister. There was a uh, satanic artwork and pentagrams described, uh, inscribed on the wall of a barn next to where he had committed his crimes. And the point of all this is just to say that like the, the profile that the mainstream media puts out is not true, right? The Ripper crew, four dudes, they involved, they were a satanic group that eight people, uh, the Dutro affair that, inf that included satanic stuff, which people don't know about, um, and that's written about in the Irish Times where they say that he was connected to a satanic cult that wanted uh, him to also commit murders for them. The Monster of Florence was a satanic serial killer. Uh, anyway, there's a couple more, but I think I mean, you get the idea, right? Like uh, I, nobody yeah, talks about these, that. If you look it, at all these modern school shooters, there's so many of them have like CIA, FBI connections. Uh, even David Hogg, who wasn't a shooter, his father was FBI. There's videos of uh, kids going, yo, this kid, this ain't a kid. This is a, this guy's a, 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 a agent of chaos or agent provocateur. You saw yep. high school kids saying that about David Hogg. His father was FBI, started a business that he sold for about $300 million that produced nothing. That produced nothing. There are videos, and we talk about this all the time, Eddie, about all the videos about that Paradise or Parkland shooting that, like, why are they out? Why, why did that get out? I think it's nonlinear warfare to get us to fight with each other. But one of them is David Hogg talking about how he wasn't even there at the school. Then you have videos of him slating people. There's supposed to be a school shooter going on. He's slating people Wednesday, you know, 10 a.m., blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. And it was during a drill they were talking about. Uh, the kid who, who the kid who supposedly, quote, unquote, air quotes, shot up the school was part of a very, very controversial uh, 
uh, kids at risk program. We've seen this before. Jeffrey Epstein, right? This is the crazy thing. Jeffrey Epstein had a camp yeah. in which he brought uh, kid, people to. Maria Bamford went there. Terry Cru- uh, Crawford or Cruz, whatever the uh, the uh, famous um, guy who did uh, the uh, the uh, Old Spice commercials that made his tits dance. That guy went there. A couple people went there. I mean, these they, these things don't just happen. I mean, we got all the kids who were part of the um, Mickey Mouse Club that just yep. end up getting used and abused and then doing propaganda. Ellen, I mean, like, I know this goes back, but Ellen just in email saying she'll do anything the CIA wants her to do. Like, that's all there, dude. The Vegas shooter had FBI, CIA connections. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that, dude. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Ted Gunderson, right? Yeah. You've, uh, you've looked into him. Ted Gunderson was... He's uh he was he's he's no longer with us. Uh, some people think he got murdered. He thought he was being poisoned. Um, but Ted Gunnerson was the head of the FBI in Los Angeles for like twenty years or so. And uh, when he retired, he like many other retired FBI agents, they start their own um, private investigation firm, and they just make you know that you know they're still working. And he got hired to look into uh, the McMartin uh, case where uh, that was a big, huge, famous case in, in the eighties all over the news where there was this preschool and I think it was uh, Redondo beach in that area is in the South Bay in LA. There was a preschool that uh, went down for a child molestation. So the mainstream narrative was, you know, a couple guys, the people that were running the daycare place or the preschool place uh, were molesting the kids, big trial. I don't remember what happened to them, but uh, the um, there was rumors that it, that preschool was connected to an international uh, child trafficking ring. And it was a part of a big monster, but the mainstream narrative never really got into that at all. They just isolated event that we're going to, these people are going to go down or whatever. And then, you know, after it was all said and done, there was still people, you know, still did, they were looking into it. And, and according to Ted Gunderson, he got hired to, uh, to fight, to do some invest, some more investigating around that school. And I think the school had been demolished at that point, but what he got hired to do is, uh, find out if there was some underground tunnels like because a bunch of the kids yep. were saying they're they're taking us under under the house right. and we're doing satanic rituals and the kids were saying that and people were just saying oh no they're you know they were being ignored and you know they're kids i don't know they got imaginations and all that stuff but ted gunnerson he looked into it i don't know what kind of instrument he used but he used some kind of i think if memory serves me right he wore some kind of uh, underground seismic thing or whatever where they they detected that there were some i'm not i, I don't know if i'm right am i correct so far with the yeah. barn case are yeah you, are but you... did you did you did you see i think it was been about two years now but two years ago the fbi declassified all the information on the finders case and the finders case which is a verified international trafficking thing um in that declassification they mentioned the mcmartin trial too and they admitted that there were tunnels that was part of the declassification oh shit that's crazy yeah. that's that crazy because that's what tender ted gunner yeah, he was uh, right figured out there like, were tunnels uh, he figured yeah. that out like 20 years ago 15 years ago yeah, exactly and, yeah. and the mainstream media to... lied and covered up so no there's no tunnels. That because that sets satanic panic for what's coming down the line which is right now but even you know again like we watched some shit from Disney. We did something on Disney and the occult and all that stuff. And like, they've been putting this satanic shit out forever. This isn't brand new what they're doing. This has been happening forever. It just seems like they're more brazen now. Yeah. And it seems like uh, Mike's son is, you know, I, 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 he's a little too young to get red pulled, uh, red pilled. Um, but you know, I, I try a little, you know what I mean? But he's so into Harry Potter 
and he loves Harry Potter, man. And when we go to Universal Studios, he puts on the cape, and I'm just sitting there just going, fuck! Am I just am I just letting them... I mean, it, it just seems like when you go to Harry Potter World, they're grooming the kids for satanic rituals. That's basically what it is. And I'm like, ah, but he's so happy, he loves it. He does. He's doing the spells and all that. And I'm like, man, I got to stop this. I got to stop this. But um, it's tough right now because he's he's just enjoying life and and um, uh, fuck. What do you think about the whole Harry Potter genre, Jay? I mean, I'm kind of I go back and forth on that one because I mean, overall, the message itself isn't bad. I mean, the fantasy element is iffy. I mean, I'm a big fan of like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, Lord of the Rings and all that stuff. I mean, I think that stuff has good messages. So I guess it just kind of depends on how the fantasy or whatever the magic's being used. It could be used in a negative way, which I think Disney does that quite a bit. Uh, but it also could be used in a positive way. I mean, there's a lot of good messages in, you know, like ancient mythology, that kind of stuff too. So um, it just depends on the, you know, case by case basis. But I'm not, I mean, I was, I didn't really get into Harry Potter because I was too old for that stuff when it was kind of getting popular in the 2000s or whatever. But, I mean, I grew up reading Lord of the Rings. So to me, that one, you know, I mean, all the messages in that are like really good, positive stuff. Well, so. from Lord of the Rings, man, um, when it first came out, I went to go see it. Love going to the movies, love watching the trailers. First Lord of the Rings comes out. Uh, I fell asleep halfway through. I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. I woke up. They're hiking. Go back to sleep, wake up again. They're fucking hiking. They're hiking. And I go, where the fuck are they hiking to? The they're fantasy hiking. hiking movie. And then they, 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 they're they on a cliff and they go, that's where we're going. You're going to Mordor? That, that, that's going to take you months. You know what I mean? They, and I know they got I know they got hobbit feet and I know they're all callous, but I'm like, dog, you need to put some fucking hiking boots on. No, I don't care how many calluses you got on your fucking feet. You cannot walk through fucking rocky mountains that go on for miles and miles but anyways i see the second one fall asleep again third one saw that shit uh while i was in maui for um jean my, my jujitsu master's wedding fell asleep to that one too i'm just like these motherfuckers it's just a hiking movie and i i swear i think it was a hiking psyop because after nobody hiked before that shit three people were hiking before lord of the rings after lord of the rings everybody's at runyon canyon uh, that's, that's a a fucking point. hobbit i think there was a, a hiking psyop but 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 <laughs> When you when you break down like the storyline, you st now 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 that my my son's all into it, so now I'm I'm watching it now. Now I'm awake and I'm not asleep and I'm trying to pay attention to it. And I know you see a lot of good shit in it, and I know you're a fan, but it's so huge. It's so there's it's so huge to me. I saw that as a New World Order uh, uh, movie. I mean, you, it, what are they doing? They're trying to get all the little castles together to unite against the evil orcs. You know what I mean? And the castles that, that say, fuck that, we don't want to get involved. What happens to them? They get fucking run over by these orcs, right? So it's like the lesson is, hey, if you don't, we don't unite and with these United Nations in this New World Order to, to, to fight the common enemy, we're all going to die. So we all have to unite. United nations against you know new world order against fake alien invasion or against terrorists you know uh they're making nuclear bombs we need to reunite together to go after them mm -hmm. i saw it as a new world order propaganda movie i could see that if i didn't know what i just kind of discovered the last week i covered this on the uh, fourth hour of alex jones the other day i went i, went, I did a deep dive on uh c.s lewis and and tolkien so C.S. Lewis wrote this trilogy, the, the guy that wrote the Narnia stuff. Like he wrote a space trilogy, which is a, a dystopian space trilogy, where uh, in the third book, he basically puts the Illuminati into the book. He calls it the it's like a scientific Tavistock Institute place in, in the UK that's trying to create a world government and kill everybody. And so he wrote into his story Tolkien as the kind of the lead hero character. And so what happens is that he basically aliens are demons, the aliens demon, the alien demons are trying to get everybody to go along with the world government. Uh, the Tolkien character is a hero. And he, in the novel, he explains the real meaning of Tolkien's books were that the ring is basically a symbol for total technological surveillance and power. That's why 
the tower that has the all seeing eye on it. That's, that's ultimately trying to spy on everybody. And they basically want to create an inverted version of the incarnation of Christ. They want an, uh, an antichrist God, man, basically. So the third book of Tolkien's trilogy, or excuse me, of Lewis's trilogy is explaining the meaning of the third uh, Tolkien trilogy, right? Does that make sense? That it's about, it's it's uh, it's the what it's about is that Sauron wants to kill everybody, who's the satanic character in Tolkien's trilogy, and that's explained in C.S. Lewis's trilogy because the same entity is trying to depopulate and kill everybody in his space trilogy. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, but the way I look at it is, yes, um, you know, people are born good. You know, I think evil people. They had shit fucked up in their childhood. That's what makes an evil person. I'm convinced mm-hmm. that we are uh, just like dogs. You raise it like a dogs are all about love. All oh, dogs, they just want love. They That's all they want. They want love more than food. But if you beat the shit out of a dog, he's going to fucking be mean and he's going to be mm-hmm. skittish. He's going to be afraid. He's going to attack you. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to unite uh, uh people good people uh, against anything um you got to paint that anything out to be evil because we're good and we want to stop evil so mm-hmm. you got to make it out as evil it, you need a reason to unite you know cuz it's i mean you're not going to have lord of the rings where uh, the orcs are good people mm-hmm. and uh like that eye is like a, a good eye you know, uh, you know, trying to stomp out evil. It mm-hmm. has to be evil. Darth Vader has to be dark. It has mm-hmm. to be. So what they're doing is like, in my opinion, they get they're using our hearts to. Uh, so we're, we're we're they're training us to unite against evil. Unite against evil. Yes, we're all uniting against evil. If you don't unite, the evil's gonna get you. So you have no choice. We all have to fight together against evil. And once they got us going on that, everyone's like, yes, unite against evil. Unite against evil. Mission accomplished. Now they're gonna create. Uh, whatever evil they want because they already got us to attack evil so all they got to do now through propaganda through the media through newspapers and books or whatever um, they're gonna uh, demonize someone who's probably good make them out to be Darth Vader make them out to be fucking that eye and Lord of the Rings and more door and orcs you know what I mean because all they got to do is because they already got us on like let's unite against evil right. so you know that's the way I look at it uh yes it's always like like in you know in Batman and Robin they're always attacking the bad guys the joker the rib it has to be that like you know that's the way they're gonna get us to go along with it there's a it's lot of stuff in Batman too what was that a billionaire saving us mm-hmm. running around with a little boy right uh <laughs> yeah. you know and the, we talked about this one of the movies was Gotham's in chaos and the masses are now trying the rich that's demonizing like grassroots populist stuff like all the all the the when the people come together against the elites that's bad a billionaire with a heart of gold that gets us to trust uh billionaires right I mean like Batman superpowers what he's got money he can make shit like that's got like that's it and they, it's just all mental psyops. I guess. I mean, it's just so the difference between then and now is like, we have a permanent record called the internet that allows us to all read their fucking playbooks and see it happen in real time. Like, what are we watching now on the internet, man? Like Netflix will take a white historical character and make it be played by a black person. And that's not, and like normally be like, I don't care. Let, let, you know, let actors act. But like this fits into this kind of cultural Marxism that we're seeing, which is like completely getting everybody not to honor history. This, this, this Lakers show right now, the whole fucking movie, the whole TV show is complete bullshit. Jeannie Buss is like making all this stuff happen. She didn't get hired till 10 years after this story, but they had to insert her into the story. Okay. The way they're making um, a Jerry West look, it's just all these stereotypes because they don't want you to know your history. 
They don't want to know any history. It's all meant to shish kebab your brain and lower your vibrations. And that's why it's all dying, in my humble opinion, because people are over it. I like I can't watch this this winning time anymore because they know the whole thing's a lie. Jay the music is dumb too. Have you uh, last thing? Have you watched any of like fucking Coachella? Like, I, like, if I hear another dumb chick talk about how there's no good men out there, it's like, yeah, because you keep supporting these fucking half a momos that are out there, right? Everybody, these guys are all playing guitar with tampons in their assholes. Fucking, like, <laughs> fucking talking about getting pregnant and shit. It's like, dude, stop bitching about men when all you support are half momos out there, okay? And stop what, with the momos. Why are we accepting and and ignoring at the same time the fact that they're pushing that men could get fucking pregnant and have it's periods. so dumb like what we can't and we're just like it, we just accept it you know what i mean we're just like oh i guess you could just google that and yeah you could google that shit and it says yes men could get pregnant like we how are we just just accepting that shit how, how come is people aren't flipping the fuck out it's just an internet thing like, dude, like, we always talk about television movies. Like, I've had shows where people talk about the computer itself is demonic. Think about what the computer has done. And we talk about television. Computer, now your phone, it's everywhere you go. And it's just pounding you with propaganda. And then you got all this, like, astroturfing going on Twitter and Instagram. Just everything's ass and just stupidity. And then, then it's retweets by bots. Like, that's why you got to turn it all off. Nobody's buying them guys. You know who hates? You know who hates that people talk about men can get pregnant? Fucking women can't stand that shit. They can't stand that shit. It's just all they talk. I mean, it's their thing. Now, now, hold on. You can get pregnant without having to have periods? Get the fuck out of here. Nobody's buying into it. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid dude you gotta bleed if you can get pregnant i'm sorry yeah. that's a that's a price of admission you don't get free drinks and backstage if you don't bleed once a month get the fuck out of here <laughs> mm-hmm. it's all double think right it's just like like 1984 totally. like that's that's a, yeah. a huge part of uh, conditioning the sheep is yeah. constantly hitting them with shit that does not make sense. Opposites, like, you know, war is peace, uh, strength is weakness. Just constantly hitting them with shit. Like, you know, during COVID, the big one, man, they had this they had this billboard right, right on the 10, and I passed by it every day on my way to the gym. Real big, hashtag alone together. Yeah, that's nutty. Exactly. Dude, and that was, dude, and that stayed up. <sighs> That stayed up for like nine months. They wouldn't take that shit down. Hashtag alone together. They 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 throw things at at society like that to uh, so that we practice doing mental gymnastics yes. to make it make sense. Because you're like, totally. oh, I see what they mean. Alone together, we're all alone because we're trying to save lives, but everybody's doing it together. So I guess we're together. You know what I mean? So I guess we're together. That's like, uh, you know, telling someone that's going to get solitary confinement for fucking 10 years, say, listen, it's not that bad. All these motherfuckers in here are in solitary confinement too. So you're going to be all right. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> like it makes zero but sense, man. That's they, why- the, they did. They roll those psyop, uh, catchphrases out hashtags remember the other one trust the science it's the same contradictory thing i mean science totally. is about doubting and proving yeah. it yeah so trust the, the science just, makes no sense like uh, how are you supposed to trust isn't science supposed to be fact you're yeah supposed right to trust it like it's supposed to be fact right you, like you don't trust facts you don't trust facts facts are just facts you're not supposed facts to trust the facts. facts the only fact remember in the, trust in the, if in someone's the... telling you a fact that you haven't checked and you got to trust them you know right that's what they want they don't want us to look into it ourselves close your eyes and just am i moving am i spinning it's that easy we're not the earth is stationary and that is scientific not pseudoscience. The Earth is spinning at 1,040 miles an hour. You can't feel it. You can't measure it. You can't observe it. 
you can't repeat it, but trust us. Trust People us. are just deceived. I mean, I grew up from kindergarten, it was a globe. They gave them a globe of graduation to take home like an inflatable baseball. So why are they teaching the globe model? Well, the globe is a container, and it's a container of all the known land. If there's more land, in the late 1800s, they were talking about more land beyond Antarctica. The North Pole is a biggie. Very glamorous destination. What if we all took our compasses out and just followed them until it stops? Oh, it is that far. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wake up. What Wake if up. we can truly become free? They needed a new model because they wanted a new world order. Open your, eyes. Open your eyes. The physics of water is to find and maintain level. This is the year of flat Earth. The heliocentric theory is bullshit. Get ready for the next level. The next level. The next level. The truth cannot be stopped. They don't want us to uh to actually look at the facts. They want you to tr trust them with the, we figured it out. We figured it out. That's why we're, you're, you're, you know, you, you get, we get into, um, you know, debates and uh, especially like, let's say flat earth, for instance, you know, we're sitting the flat earth. People are saying, we don't trust the science that you're putting out that's propaganda on a lot so many levels on so many levels we don't trust these books that they're putting out the text we don't trust that science and then when you get into debate with them they just quote shit off the books i'm like you haven't figured shit out you haven't figured shit out they go yeah the sun is they think they think they're so smart the sun is 93 Hear million me? miles away no. the sun is 93 they 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 think they're so smart when they say that i'm like what right. How old were you when you did the experiment to prove that shit? Or did you <laughs> right. just read it? Because you tell me how you proved yourself yeah. that the sun is 93 million miles away. No, 93. you fucking what book that, and Jay? you memorized it. You didn't do any, you didn't do any fucking experiment. You read a book and you had faith in no, exactly. Jay, 93, that's an occult number. That's Philema. 93, 93. You see 93s, 33s all the time man all the time so i think there's i know you're not a flat earther probably jay but i know that there's just like these weird things that you go okay dude like no i'm a, just, i'm not i'm a skeptic like i don't i don't have a position on uh me too a dude. lot of cosmological stuff i just don't think that what they say is true like i i, I like the you're big on your way jay totally you're on your way it's gonna take you almost there, man. Man. is you're retarded big now, bang now, is retarded. What, now jay uh, what do you believe as far as uh, the moon landings? Did we actually go or do you think it was faked for sure? Here. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, if, if I accept the mainstream story about the moon landing, <laughs> I have to also accept that they're literally up there jacking around and playing golf on the moon. So you yeah. want me to believe that <laughs> life and death situation, the slightest little thing could go wrong in this old ass janky 1960s crappy technology which looks like it's from a b movie they're out there playing golf on the moon yeah yeah okay you're on your That's way <laughs> come on you're gonna be a flat earther within 18 months but but at first <laughs> you're not you're months. not you're not gonna want to discredit your work because you you've done so much research and so you've read a, how many books you read uh, five thousand you, uh, oh. you don't want to bring <laughs> trust me are you are you married? Yeah. 
Oh, okay, so you don't have to worry about it. If you were single, I would say do not bring up <laughs> right. trying to get laid. You do it's not. It's hard to get laid if you're a flat earther. Yeah, you got to have a separate Instagram with no flat earth <laughs> shit in it. You know what I mean? You were trying to get laid. You got to have a ball, gl- a globe earth behind it. <laughs> There's like four girls that are into flat earth. But, um, <laughs> and they're not hot. <laughs> are they flat? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the whole thing, if you, okay, so you're uh, at, at the very least suspect of what they presented as evidence that we went to the moon um oh yeah i I think that was a psyop Uh, have you read okay okay dave mcgowan's book on it it's great oh he believes it was fake too oh he has a book dude that's it's actually funny it's a it's a literally all he does in his book is show the contradictory claims of the astronauts and what nasa says yeah. Oh, by the way, we lost the technology to go there. Oh, by the way, sorry, That's we lost so all the footage. Stupid, dude. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that retarded? Yeah, their their so representative, dumb. Don Pettit, mm-hmm. there he is not getting blood to every part of his brain. That's a hundred percent. Because you hear that, I mean, you hear that guy. He, I mean, he said, I, I would go back to the moon in a nanosecond, except. We don't have the technology no more. We destroyed the technology. Yeah. And we a lot of people don't know that. They, they don't know the crazy shit that NASA has said, right? Yeah. And, you know, when you, you go back in, into the origins of NASA and yep. Warner Von Braun, right? Like, 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 wait a minute. When you learn about when you learn about Operation Paperclip and yeah. then you learn that the Nazis that they brought into the United States after World War Two, they changed most of their names. But they didn't change Warner Von Braun's name. Hitler's right hand man, his rocket man. They used Hitler's rocket man, and he had a German accent. Like you would think they wouldn't. They would hit that motherfucker. Used him to design <laughs> the rockets and whatever you want to do. You want to lo- launch a rocket and then fucking land in the Bermuda Triangle. Be my guest. But dude, I think that was a that was not a good move, man. That dude. Or, <laughs> what you know about Jack Parsons name. too, right? What was that? Jack Parsons, you know about him too, right? Yeah, he uh, uh, JPL. He was right. the one. Uh, JPL was the company that actually built the technology for NASA, and Jack Parsons was. I mean, I hear he was, uh, you know, an, an occultist. He was into Satan, right? right? Oh, but uh, known liar too, right? So, like, <laughs> I mean, he got, bu- he got busted for selling uh, secrets to other countries. I mean, so I mean. In other words, a totally sus dude, right? So, yeah. I mean, everything about it ends up being totally sus. I mean, uh, if you read, you know, even mainstream accounts of the history of NASA, like, in my view, NASA is basically just a front for um, projecting whatever psyops and, like, things were necessary at the time. Uh, now I don't really think it matters. It's like the, the now the billionaires have like taken over that. And I mean, I just don't believe any of these zillionaire billionaire people are actually going to take anybody to Mars. Come they're on. not, bro. I mean, come you on, got it. like it's so amazing to me how everybody's like, oh my god, dude, uh, the Van Allen belt, the Van Allen belt, and then like nobody thinks it could be easily be the firmament too. Have you I mean, seen like- that clip of the of that of the NASA guy saying that? Well, there's a problem with getting through the Van Allen belt. Yeah, 100 percent from why like 10 do, years ago. It's why a clip doesn't of an anyone a- believe that could be the firmament? Will someone please explain that to me? Well, but he's but so there's a NASA dude saying from 10 years ago saying that the problem with space travel is the Van Allen belt. Well, hello. Then how did you go to the moon? Exactly. Exactly. There's. I mean, it's so fucking obvious, man. I mean, it's so goddamn. Have obvious. you seen the the news stories about the the rocks that the astronauts gave out? Yeah, they're apparently all, they're, they're all fake. They're yeah. all mainstream yeah. media articles admitting that the rocks that Buzz Aldrin, you know, give gave his gifts from the moon. They're not from the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you familiar oh, yeah. with um, the Antarctic Treaty? Uh, that you can't go there or whatever. Yeah. Are you I've heard of that this. at all? I've heard I of think this. it was in 1958 when they signed it. Every goddamn country in the world, they said, OK, no, Connell, uh, 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 let's protect the penguins and let's right. leave Antarctic, Antarctica alone. If you want to uh, visit it, 
you got to you got to jump through mad hoops and go through all the shit. Then they give you a little tour on this little peninsula. You see a couple penguins. If you're lucky, you'll see a fucking one of those leopard seals. And then, boom, there's a symbolic South Pole thing. You take a couple selfies. <clears throat> But it's really, really, really hard to go to them. People don't believe that. Go, oh, anybody can go. Anybody can go. No, it's very fucking hard. Alex Jones, he doesn't believe the earth is flat. He, he believes we went, went to the moon and we get in arguments and debates. And he goes, Eddie, I'm going to finance a trip down to Antarctica. Let's do it. We're going to prove this once and for all. They're not yeah. eating babies in Antarctica. Like, you know, so he, he was really into it. And I've looked into it so goddamn much that I know that you, you can't go. And if I was able just to fucking go, you're out there like a sitting duck, man. They could fucking just snipe your ass. I ain't going down to Antarctica. I don't want to go out there. I don't want to go to the jungle. I don't. I just want to go snowboarding. That's it. I'll go snowboarding. I ain't trying to go to no jungle. I ain't trying to go to no Antarctica. Fuck that shit. You know, um, I know enough to go. Oh, you believe there's an ice wall. That, how about there's fucking endless pictures and video of the fucking ice wall? They're all over the, the ice wall. We're surrounded by an ice wall and people are like, ah, it's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> there's massive. There's massive video and pictures of this. It's not an iceberg, dog. That shit goes on for miles and miles and miles and miles. 200 foot wall, just like Game of Thrones, dog. It's the same shit. There's mad evidence of that. So I don't want to really get into um, all that, but uh, I, it's, it's good to know. God damn it. It's good to know that you're not fooled by the moon landing. That's it goes you. deep, dog. It's, it's nice to know because I would be extremely disappointed if you were like, yeah, you know, I don't really I haven't really looked in the moon. I kind of just, you know, focus on what's going on here. You know, I don't want to really I really don't you know, I don't know that that would have disappointed me. But you have done your work and you 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 have looked into it. And it's it's uh, <laughs> it. Uh, I like you more now. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I just think the, the 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 thing that was the ultimate convincer for me was when just reading Dave's book, showing contradictions, and then the if you just think about how they portray space travel and the moon as life or death situation, think of all the movies where it's like, oh, they're coming back, and will they get into the ozone before they run out of air, and it's so dangerous. Yeah, but they're playing golf on the moon, and if you believe NASA, you have to believe they play golf on the moon. Yeah, which is yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 total horse shit. Um, <clears throat> um, now okay, enough about space and flat Earth. Uh, I want to get back into before we we close up the Tavistock Institute in the UK and what can, can you tell uh, the, the the audience a little bit about the Tavistock in Institute? Right. So that started as a military connected thing to study uh soldiers that came back from world war one that had they, they coined the term shell shock so they started studying post-traumatic stress um that got them deeper into studying the psyche and and the what motivates humans then they got a big bunch of money from the rockefeller foundation to beef it up into uh a more serious project to study mind control so it's basically like mk ultra in the uk and by the way, uh, MK Ultra, man, I, I've done a whole bunch of research into that going even deeper. It turns out that other countries were doing CIA MK Ultra stuff overseas that, that was easier for them to do it rather than legalities in the US. So, like Australia, for example, Australia had dozens of MK Ultra programs running throughout the whole period of MK Ultra um, that was off the books. Can you, give, can you utilized, give a couple examples? Can you give a couple of examples of yeah, what they, even they utilized, did specifically? Yeah. So part of that was uh, Papua New Guinea off the coast. They studied, that's where they, they uh, figured out that they could weaponize prions. What's that? So prion, that's, well, like, you know how that people were saying with the, the, the vaccines, the stabbies and all that, that, that they had prions, right? That's mad cow disease, basically. Okay. So they studied the cannibals in Papua New Guinea and the diseases that they would get, kuru disease, mad cow disease, basically same thing. It's from from eating like rotten meat and, and humans. You get you go crazy, right? And basically causes al Alzheimer's. Uh, and so they, they discovered and isolated prions through studying those cultures, the military did, 
um, as one of the adjunct programs of, of MK Ultra. Um, they also used uh, a serial killer who was doing, uh, he's one of the most famous serial killers in Australia because he was a doctor of a sleep clinic and he was just basically getting, he was putting people to death through, through sleep. <laughs> it's a, he's a famous guy. I'll have to, I'll have to get up uh, all my MK Ultra notes out, but those are two examples of uh, MK Ultra studies in Australia, but um but the Tavistock yeah. Institute, getting back to that. But the, yeah, uh, Tavistock was basically doing the they, same stuff in the they, UK. They pro- didn't they have something to do with the the Beatles and Led Zeppelin? So uh, John Coleman put that in his book. Um, I'm not saying that I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I don't know what his source is on that. I mean, he, he could be right. I know that Tavistock studied um, the arts and aesthetics and, a lot, and people from the Frankfurt School worked at Tavistock, like uh, Kurt Lewin. Um, and he's a connect between, he also worked in MK ultra. So there's a connection between Tavistock Frankfurt school and, uh, MK ultra through Kurt Lewin. And he was interested in studying the arts and weaponizing the arts. So I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a Beatles Tavistock connection, but I just don't know. I haven't verified it. Okay. 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 Um, now Back to NASA again. There's one thing I forgot to ask you, and you had mentioned at the top of this podcast that you've um, you've uh, researched free, Freemasonry, and um, you know you're aware that all the astronauts that faked going to the moon were Freemasons. Yeah, they make it very obvious. They're very open about it. Yeah. 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 What do you think the, the Freemason, why are there so many Freemasons in NASA? It seems like uh, working at certain levels in the government require that a lot of, t- I mean, not everybody's in a secret society, but at certain levels, that's good for, uh, it's kind of like an intelligence agency. I mean, the, the Freemasons, If you, there's a really good book on this from a historian uh, Jessica Harlan Jacobs, and she talks about how the Freemasons were for the British Empire their spy network. So, you know, I'm not denying that they are into you know esoteric occult stuff, but the practical function of them for the British Empire was uh, espionage and being a conduit for for intelligence. So, I think the same thing goes on um, at the at the government level a lot of people are involved in that stuff because it's a good way to traffic in secrets they take oaths to keep secrets um so i think it makes perfect sense that a bunch of people at nasa and a bunch of astronauts would be part of a secret society where they take oaths to lie i mean they have to lie i mean that's like part of the oath right yeah it's like um it's like a punk that they're like an eternal punk that they're they're doing they're they're like there's no morals. It's it's all about we got to yeah. do it for the show. We right. got a mission. You say what the truth has nothing to do with anything. We're just trying to accomplish a mission. And like they don't even the truth means nothing. It's just about uh, yeah. getting things done. You know, there's a movie that shows that too about the Masons. Have you ever seen uh, the Man Who Would Be King with Michael Caine and Sean Connery? No. No, the Michael Caine's got a movie. You gotta what, watch it. What dude. is that movie about? So they're they're Freemasons in the movie. And okay. they go and they try to find a tribe out in the middle of nowhere to dupe them into believing that they're divine. Mm. And so they're basically hoodwinking. They're, they're, they're doing what you said to like this. Anyway, the tribe ends up, I don't want to spoil it, but the tribe ends up catching on to their scam. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, I won't uh, tell you what happens. We'll it's kind of like, I want to see that. What's it called again? It's a famous, it's a famous Masonic movie. It's a, it's a Rudyard Kipling story. And he was a famous. What British year did Freemason. that come out? Do you remember? Uh, it's probably a late 60s, 69. Oh, it's 69. old, old. Okay, what's yeah. it called? Again? Michael Caine and Sean Connery. It's called The Man Who Would Be King. You got to watch the that. The Man Who Would Be King. I, and it, it, pre- it shows that Masons are basically committed to kind of scamming everybody in line. It stands the test of time because a lot of 60s movies look cheesy. Is it like Apocalypse Now stands the test of time? Uh, you know. It's kind of cheesy, but it makes your point. I mean. Okay. Okay. And and uh, that remember that movie, The Village, by uh, yeah. M. Night M. Night Shyamalan. Ding dong. Yeah. That was kind of a little. That was that was some CIA right there, or mind control rather. It's or, a mind control uh, cult. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Crazy stuff, man. Um. Uh. What What do you you What do you What's the connection between the Vatican and Freemasonry? 
So I think the Vatican has at times acted or pretended to, to be opposed to Freemasonry, but I think that they're pretty much aligned. I mean, the F- Freemasonry pretty much champions the last several popes for the last 50 or 60 years. Like b- various important lodges will say they're happy with the election of John the 23rd. We're happy with the election of uh, Pope Francis. So I-, I think they're all pretty much on the same page now. What do you think of the conspiracy theory that the Vatican created the Jesuit order to infiltrate Freemasonry and take it over? And, uh, uh, and the Je- when they banned the Jesuits, that's when the Illuminati came out. It's just they're all part. I of mean, the, the Jesuits did have uh, their own esoteric origins. Uh, Ignatius Loyola was part of a group called the Illuminados in Spain, which means Illuminati. Um, so his origins, he comes out of uh, a secret society background. And then the Jesuits um, did have an intention at various times to infiltrate any type of group. So that would probably include uh, opposition like Freemasons. So there is I think there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. Hmm. OK. Um, now, as far as rock stars of today, we were talking about the 60s and stuff. rock stars of today. Like I, I just I did a podcast um, a podcast last week about Kiss, like my whole Kiss story. I was like in the Kiss cult. I was balls deep in the Kiss. I still love Kiss. And there was a lot of love in that podcast. But I also talked about, uh, you know, uh, being aware now that like, damn, I was. I was like brainwashed into liking a lot of their music. A lot of the stuff, they had a lot of bad albums. And I was like, just, I have to like them because, you know, I, I just saw the good in everything. And uh, now looking back and, and I look back at Kiss and I thought, man, if, if uh, they weren't some kind of deep state Illuminati rock star Perf, you know, uh, uh, operation, they should have been. Because if you think about it, the four members that were each, rocks there were it wasn't like a regular band where you had the singer like queen you had you know um freddie mercury and like no one really knew who the drummer was that much and brian may the guitar player he, he was like he was kind of known but the bass player is not really that popular or, or that famous like you know that's how most bands are um but uh kiss they were four rock stars put together and each of their personas and their makeup and all that shit one was a demon demon dragon he looked pretty damn satanic spit blood uh b- breathe fire he uh, you know if if that this was like an illuminati dream band it's perfect because you had a demon you had a spaceman got all about space that's perfect satan space like dude perfect <laughs> And then Paul Stanley, which, um, you know, uh, he he was very flamboyant on stage, which was very common uh, 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 back in the 70s, you know. But looking back, all the ones that were flamboyant, you know, they were so it was like, uh, you know, you know, as far as the deep state Illuminati dream band, boom, you get a guy who's, you know, uh, very feminine on stage, uh, even though he sang about girls, but still, he was, you know, he was very feminine and, you know, um, and that's huge these days. Uh, and then the fourth guy, he was the cat. And, you know, I kind of did mental gymnastics to try to piece that together to, to like, man, this is like the perfect Illuminati band is a deep state dream. But the cat, when you look into it, uh, uh, ancient Babylonians and according, according to what I saw on the internet, ancient Babylonians and ancient Egyptians, like the Pharaohs, they worshiped cats. I don't know if that's exaggerated or not, but it says that they worship cats. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. So then that would make sense. You know, you know, you, you look at this, the, the, the Sphinx, isn't the Sphinx a gigantic uh, lion or something like that, or, yeah. or, or a tiger or something. Uh, so if you look at in that, look at kiss in, in that light, man, that's, that's a, that's a Illuminati dream right there, that band. Um, and uh, they're just singing about banging chicks and just having fun and not giving a sh- don't listen to anybody, you know. Uh, but my question is, uh, what modern day rock stars, if you had a gun to your head, that you had like, the, if these, like, which ones for sure do you think are part of, are conscious of being part of, uh, some kind of deep state Illuminati uh, program. Which ones are like, like for sure? Like, <laughs> would you say for sure, Lady Gaga? Like for sure? Oh yeah, Lady right? Gaga. Real quick, Gaga is the name for Pluto, 
and Pluto was known as the messenger of Saturn, which is going back to the black cube of Saturn. So she says she got from Radio Gaga, but Gaga literally is the messenger of the black cube of Saturn. Jay, what do you think? If you had to, if you had to pick a couple out, I know you don't want to get uh, yeah, I mean, for I defamation. Think the- no, the without a question, uh, Madonna and Beyonce. Hell sure. yeah, yeah, Hell I do yeah. for sure. I mean, if 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 they're not if they're not part of whatever you want to call it, Illuminati, deep state, it, like that that eyes wide shut level. If yep. if they're not involved, then no one is. Then all right. rock stars <laughs> yeah, are organic. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And I mean, I would throw Lady Gaga in there. Her she's a disciple yeah. of Marina Abramovic. Right. Exactly. What? what a Marina Abramovic for those of you that don't know, look into her. She's the celebrity to the celebrities. She's right. like some satanic fucking a witch. witch. She's a witch. Yeah. 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 And, and she's all like, uh, you know, remember at just like last year, Google, I think it was Google or micro Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. I made Microsoft a video about had a commercial yeah. with Marina Brom Abramovic and it bombed to paint her out as like some, some, some like, uh, some, abstract artist or you know right. what i mean and, the, and then yeah. they pulled that in, in less than a day they pulled it with right. the backlash that's kind of a um you know that makes me feel like there's some hope you know what i mean that shit they they try to shove that down our fucking throats microsoft with marina abramovic and then they yeah. pulled it from pressure i believe that art of the future is art without objects this is just pure transmission of energy between the viewer and the artist. To me, mixed reality is this answer. This was a unique opportunity to take the most legendary artists working now and capture them in such a way that they are translatable forever. If you're a collector, you're trying to find works that break new ground. We here at Christie's believe that this is that. And it will be the first time that a mixed reality artwork is sold at auction. There was always question what you buy when you buy performance. You buy the video or you buy the edition of photographs. Here, you actually can have the artist's presence in your collection. The first thing that we had to figure out was you had to feel that you were in the room with Marina, not a document of Marina. So HoloLens 2 was created by people who quite clearly have an interest in the audience forgetting that they are using technology. So the purest expression of artistic intent can happen. I really want viewer to be with me in the space in here and now. The life is dealing with what is going to stay after I'm not there anymore. And I can face myself. And that's a frightening experience. Really like you're facing your own ghost. There is always this great idea of immortality. Once you die, the work will never die because the work of art can continue. In performance, the piece is only in the memory of the audience and nowhere else. Here, I am kept forever. And there's, there's like, damn, there's hope in this world, you know, so when shit like that happens. 100% dude if you take yeah. a look at rap man and hip hop dude look what they did with that I mean like you only got pushed forward if you played a certain stereotype uh, uh, stereotype uh, image I mean the hip hop was I mean we talk about heavy metal and hair metal, metal being pushed out for grunge I mean hip hop you had all this positive hip hop going on and they couldn't get radio play for this gangster shit and like the more gangster or degrading your character is the more you get pushed the baby a grown man walking around with diapers on come on man that's all it is and now you got like bad bunny who's like just basically a a cross dresser i mean like dude the all this shit gets you got to you got to be plug and play stereotypes to get super promoted in Hollywood, I mean, even actors, I tell people, you want to be, you know, you really want to work in Hollywood, be a stereotype. Stereotypes with sassy black chick, dickhead jock guy. It's all plug and play, plug and play, plug and play. Even in stand up, it's all cookie cutter yeah, shit. Right. Everything is like plug and play, plug and play, plug. Are you pushing a narrative that they want out? Are you pushing a narrative that you want out? And it's all that stuff. 
Yeah, do you see that? You 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 brought up Madonna, that one video from like uh, a month ago where I, it looked like, I don't know, maybe she was just really stoned or drunk or something, but she did. She put a video out on Instagram and I don't know. What do you think of that video? You know what I'm talking about? Can you find that? Yeah, where quick? she like kisses yeah, the that. camera? Like yeah. what like the hell was that? Cat lady? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. that's your cat thing. Maybe aliens are really cats. And it's a war against dogs. <laughs> hey, you know what? Dogs are all about love. That's the number one thing on the menu with dogs. They are, they don't care how long you've been gone. When you get home, they don't, they don't, they unconditional love. Dogs are unconditional love. And what's dog spell backwards? God. Maybe dogs are 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 here to remind us of the frequency we're supposed to be on the dog frequency, the God frequency. What is all cat backwards? Unconditional love. Dogs are all about unconditional love. Cat backward ever- is tack, which is total alien control. Think about that, dude. <laughs> that? Okay, check out this. Check out this Madonna video. Yeah, this I mean- bizarre behavior in a new TikTok video has left fans asking if she's okay. Madonna no, posted a clip just before the 2022 Grammy Awards on Sunday showing the material girl musician wearing heavy silver chains Why and a black shirt top with this, her blonde bro? hair I, and her like, pouting I'm, face. I'm feeling is. She looks Staring like a Staring into the camera with full cheeks and a wrinkle-free forehead, Madge moved closer and closer to the lens before turning her plump lips into a pout. She recently Dude. shocked fans again by looking decades younger in her new Frozen music video remix, Madonna's trying to fucking run from the devil, dude. The devil collects, bro. The devil collects. Dude, you know how she, you know a, how her skin looks album like that. Cover she, right there. The devil collects. The devil collects is it should be the name of your n- new comedy special. <laughs> the devil collects. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> Jay, you were you were saying something? I interrupted. I had, I had, we had dinner uh, one night with the guy that used to be her security dude, and he was telling us explaining what's up with her he was just saying all these crazy things these crazy stories but he said that the reason that her skin looks like that because she's like a grandma age right she's like 70 something right yeah but the reason that her skin looks like that he said that she has this mask that she wears and she won't let anybody film her or take pictures unless she wears this really high priced mask that like pulls her face back that's so a that's mask she, that's on her yeah. real face right according to her for former well, security dude. oh I don't know. You don't think so? <laughs> I, I, is I, I would, a clone? A gun to my head, I would say uh, she is a, a customer uh, at Ambrosia, that one company that, uh, you know, they transfuse old people. Yeah. With, they say teen blood. Right. They say but teen it, blood. Yeah. Can you imagine right. you have to, that your blood has to be 18 or over, you know what right. I mean? Otherwise it's illegal. So that's, that's already out in the open. Can you find Ambrosia? They're That's it's already children of the corn shit. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're already normalizing teen blood, right? So basically they're saying if you're old and you're fucked up, if you get a blood transfusion with teen blood, that it it gives you like a miraculous health benefits. And, right, yeah. And if if they're saying that, then are their customers asking for younger blood and is is it is it the younger the better or is probably teen the best? Yeah. You know what I mean? They're they're making yeah. people think like, oh shit, young blood is good. So they get people into teen blood, teen blood, teen blood, teen, and then boom, you know what? Ten year olds' bloods are a little better. You know, ten year old, it's exactly. not teen technically, right. but ten is better. And people are like, fuck it, I've been doing sixteen year old blood, you know, for a while now. <laughs> right. I'll go down to ten year, old. and then yeah. boom, then they <laughs> accept they accept the ultimate. You know what right. I mean? which is Adrena fucking Chrome, you know, yeah. that's, uh, I know that's a conspiracy theory, but you know, they're well, but but is it so far- interesting is that everybody's like, there's this guy that won Duncan Trussell's whole thing. And that he was basically saying that fucking adrenochrome is a psyop and stuff like that. And it's just like, maybe dude, maybe, but like all these, like over the last seven years, what is the conspiracy theorist got completely wrong? What is like, what is, what is their batting average? And if you're yeah, sitting there right. telling me that like Q's all garbage and I get it, I get there's a lot of people hate Q, but what's your take on January 6th 
What's your take on Russian collusion? What's your take on the virus? Because everything that's come out is basically confirm what the conspiracy theorists have been saying. Totally. And I'm sure there's some controlled opposition out there. And I'm com- I'm pretty sure there's misinformation agents out there. But based on like the community, we've been more right than we've been wrong. So if there's a big movement saying this is something that they do, right, then why would you sit there and just demonize it because it just doesn't fit your mind? The problem with the left is that they have no, they're goldfish, and they don't remember all the elves they've been taking right. since, like, the Bernie Sanders got clipped by Hillary for the DNC primary. Yeah. Loss at the loss at the loss at the loss because the internet knows everything. And it's just super interesting. It, well, remember that. So when you, if you talked about uh, blood drinking, right? Oh, that's crazy. It doesn't exist. Well, then Megan Fox comes out and says, well, uh, yeah, it exists, but it's just a little bit. Well, I <laughs> well, it didn't this exist. Check this out. Here's the ambrosia. The aging process simply by getting a blood transfusion. That's what a new company called Ambrosia claims to do. And they just opened a new facility right here in the Houston area. Rekha Mutaraj spoke to the founder to find out how young blood works. It's a controversial startup. Ambrosia is the brainchild of Dr. Jesse Carmazin. And right now, there are five clinics located across the U.S. Carmazin says 150 people have already gone through the process, and several of them have even done it a second time. My name is Jesse Carmazin, and as you heard, I'm the founder of Ambrosia, and we're a company interested in making you young again. Okay, Jesse look at all those weird triangles behind him, huh? Blood, young blood, preferably that of a person under the age of 25. We know that as you get older, your stem cells aren't replicating as well as when you were young. And this leads to most illnesses. He explained the science behind it during the Superhuman Summit in 2017. And when they were sewn together, he found that the old mouse, which received the blood of the young mouse, became young again. So its gray hair turned black. It could remember mazes better. Its heart pumped better. In fact, in every way, it became young again. If vampires are the first thing that comes to mind, Karmazin, in a phone interview with us, explained the process doesn't involve blood in its entirety, but plasma, the white translucent component that remains after white and red blood cells and platelets are removed. The results? The wrinkles are better. Their skin has a better color to it. And furthermore, this guy the is front. the calm of a serial killer, right? Patients with symptoms <laughs> of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, diabetes. And by measuring biomarkers, he told me people have also shown improvements in cholesterol levels and inflammation. There is no published data to prove these claims, although Karmazin says scientific evidence from his clinical trials will soon be available. In the meantime, people continue to sign up for treatments on the company's website, which cost $8,000 for a liter of plasma, $12,000 for two liters. Just another sign that the promise of youth is a booming business. The company wouldn't tell us the exact location of its Houston clinic, except to say it's located uh, uh, near shady. Houston Methodist Willowbrook <laughs> Hospital. What are the risks and how was the company yeah, able to get FDA say. approval? We'll have those answers. Plus, doctors weigh in on the process. Yeah, Crazy nothing shady shit. about that. Where where you located? Well, we can't really tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, hey, we gotta we gotta wrap it up. Hey Jay, we're gonna do this again. I hope I hope you had a good time. Yeah, we can go on forever, man, because I got I got all this shit written down. We're already at that two hour mark. Um, we're gonna do Jay Dyer, Dyer part two, part three, part ten. Sam Tripoli, you're gonna you're gonna be on this all the goddamn time. Um, uh, thank you. I, I, any last uh, final plugs you want to give Jay Dyer? How can we find you? Yeah, uh, like like you, I'm on Rockfin as well, so you can find uh, my stuff there. Um, I have a website, jaysanalysis.com, that sort of archives everything. Got a subscription service there too. Um, I host the Fourth Hour of Alex Jones every Friday, so you can check me out there over on Alex's stuff, Infowars, and Band Video, um, YouTube channel, Jay Dyer. That's it. Awesome, Jay and Sam. Any any plugs you want to plug our, our Florida dates? Yeah, man, we're gonna be in Florida. What are the dates on that, Hetty? June um, 19th and uh, Tallahassee and Jacksonville. Just go to samtriple.com. 
Go to samtriply.com for everything, dude. You know, I got a lot of uh, great stuff going on. And, like, I got this this telegram that's killing it. But I know it's just a matter of time before they come for me. So if you go to samtriply.com, there's a ton of places to, for everybody to talk. But it's, uh, yeah, June 17th and June 18th. Just go to samtriply.com. All things Sam Tripoli there. Thank you, guys. Have a good I night. I love you, dude. And I appreciate your work. You guys are doing um, awesome work. And uh, I, I love I love you, Sam. Love you, Jay. See It'd you be great if people so talked a little less. I mean, he's constantly talking. <laughs> he doesn't have a mic. Oh, we okay. haven't got, he forgot his mic. He'll have a mic next time. <laughs> well, it was great. Always a pleasure chopping up with both you guys. Right, I love, yeah, you. love you guys. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Bye. Good night. The Jiu-Jitsu Dojo is the ultimate training ground for life. Jiu-Jitsu will accelerate the evolution of your being, your consciousness, your soul. Through this amazing art, you will prove to yourself that you can master anything you set your mind to. Happy birthday, Eddie Bravo. I leave for Brazil tomorrow. Are you the fear factor guy? I'm uh, like six pounds over, time to sweat it out. Just imagine someone that has no idea how different your game is. I'll tell you what this weekend was, man. It was a culmination point where all your hard work comes to like one great moment in time. You showed that you're a fucking champion. Guy who goes against convention. You created your own shit and figured interesting ways to get around problems in jujitsu. And shows you that great things are possible if you work hard, if you dedicate yourself and you use your creativity and you push through. Your own human potential just goes up. My 10th Planet Association has grown rapidly to over 70 academies worldwide, and their curriculums are all synced to 10th Planet headquarters located in downtown Los Angeles. I'm Eddie Bravo. I hope to see you on the mats. You can tell it's real because it looks so fake.